the 20th Red Cross International Humanitarian Law Moot presents Understanding the Situation in the Politzker Region Prosecutor against Lucretia Barcino The Region of Politzka The Region of Politzka is an enclave situated within the state of Bashkazan, a former colony of the Kingdom of Parm together with its neighboring Republic of Tavir. A Tavir Politzka ethnic group was formed in the 19th century as the Kingdom of Parm encouraged Tavir inhabitants to migrate to Politzka for mining. In 1963, Politzka fell under Tavir sovereignty by a referendum despite Bashkazan's consistent opposition. Since then, multiple armed conflicts took place and Politzka was eventually occupied by Bashkazan. Meanwhile, the Polo's population was polarized, leading to the emergence of Polo's Liberation Front, the PLF, that opposes Bashkazan's occupation in Polotska through launching violent attacks, and the Polo's Reunification and the Autonomy Party, the PRAP, formed to politically advocate for the minority's wishes for a peaceful reunification with Tavir. Subsequently, in 1999, despite the agreement reached between the PRAP and the Bashkazan government to have Bashkazan forces retreat from Polotska, the PLF rejected the agreement and carried on the fight, launching attacks against the Polos government and surrounding villages. The Bashkazan armed forces would then close the region off and arrest suspected members of the PLF with the assistance of the local police force as a revenge. Ms. Lucretia Barcino and Barktech. AI visionary, Ms. Lucretia Barcino is a Parmian who founded the multinational company Barktech, which specializes in information and communication technology, artificial intelligence, and social media. She is actively involved in the development of Barktech by contributing ideas for improvements. The company has significant business interests in both Bashkazan and Tavir. Most importantly, it runs a project by which data is collected through public CCTV cameras, apps, and social media on smartphones for the purpose of traffic, health services, and security in Bashkazan. Despite so, the data is collected with the consent of the users and stored on servers within the state. In particular, Polograd, the capital of Polska, is one of the first cities where the smart city project is rolled out in the test phase. Panopt in Polotska. In December 2019, a mass rally broke out in Polotska when a pro-PLF teenager named Andrei Dapvoy died during a chase by the Polotska police. BarkTalk, a social media owned by BarkTech, was flooded with messages to support the PLF. Later, Bashkazan government requested Ms. Lucretia to hand over all the data of BarkTalk users to make arrest of pro-PLF Polotskans. To detain so many arrestees, Bashkazan government inquired Bogtech about its AI program, Panopt, a technology used for monitoring in which prisoners must obtain approval through an app to leave their premises. The location of the prisoners would also be broadcasted by the app during the leave. Ms. Lucretia then adjusted the app and delivered it in April 2020. Polotsk, who were involved in spreading messages to support the PLF, were confined to their homes and monitored by Panopt. They can only leave their premises at designated times, and they would be imprisoned if they violate the restriction of the confinement. Use of Eagle Eye AI targeting software Military escalation took place between the border of Tavir and Bashkazan in June 2020, following the announcement of the president of Tavir to reunify Polska with Tavir at the cost of war. The PLF was able to gain control of large parts of Polska, including its capital, Polograd thanks to the RPG dispersed by the Tavir Armed Forces. In addition, PLF fighters would blend in with civilians before and after attacks. Later in July 2020, severe civilian casualties prompted the Armed Forces suspended all operation in Polotska. In August 2020, the Bashkazan government contacted Ms. Lucretia to develop an AI program called Eagle Eye a program for distinguished civilians from PLF fighters. By September 2020, the software exhibited satisfactory results in identifying individuals, threat or threat in small groups of individuals, while detection in larger groups still required more processing time. 
On the 5th of September 2020, Eagle Eye software was deployed to operate in mountainous terrain outside Polograd, whereby the targeting system would automatically identify potential threats, select targets, and fire in 10 seconds, subject to the gunner's reaction, rendering fewer civilian casualties and less damage to armored vehicles. On the 18th of September 2020, civilians blocked the streets to store the advance of the Bashkazan Armed Forces under the PLF's appeal. In particular, a large crowd of around 250 civilians blocked the Old Town Plaza. When Lieutenant Fasili Petrol left his vehicle to try negotiating a peaceful evacuation of the square, Eagle Eye Software detected a potential threat in a building behind the civilians and fired, causing the panicked civilians to start throwing stones at the armored vehicles in a knee-jerk reflex. These citizens were then identified as potential threats by Eagle Eye Software. Eventually, 37 were killed and 42 were wounded. Development and use of Zealand While Bashkazan armed forces try to find other ways to support their ground force, Ms. Lucretia, on behalf of Barktech, suggested its Zealand AI program that specialized on selecting military target. To help Bashkazan take back Polotska, Zealand was deployed to observe the sign of PLF and collect all gathering locations of PLF ranging from churches to command centers and munition stockpiles in Polograd. After successfully identifying the characteristic of the location, Zealand drone strike has been carried out to kill the PLF fighters. Several attacks happened at the St. Elijah's Church and the Mountain View Sanatorium in the north of Polograd, causing numerous deaths including innocent locals, patients, and medical staff. Software engineers told Ms. Lucretia that the Zealand cannot correctly identify the military object and a civilian object. Ms. Lucretia ordered Patch to avoid accidental injury to civilians. However, the problem still cannot be solved. Ms. Lucretia ordered the software engineers to closely monitor it and patch it if necessary. Arrests and Charges in April 2021, the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant against Ms. Lucretia. She claimed that she was only developing technology in a developing country. The Office of Prosecution accused Ms. Lucretia of various charges. Firstly, considering the use of PANOP in Polotka, she might have violated Article 25, brackets 3, brackets D of the Rome Statute, since she was assisting the commission of war crime of unlawful confinement. Secondly, considering the use of Eagle Eye AI targeting software, she might have breached Article 25, brackets 3, brackets C of Rome Statute since she was assisting the commission of war crime of intentionally directing attacks against the civilians. Thirdly, considering the development of Zealand AI program, she might have contravened Article 25, brackets 3, brackets A of the Rome Statute because she was intentionally directing attacks against places where the people there were not military objectives. Now that you know what happened in Polotska, you're ready to observe how the mooters advance their arguments. Enjoy!
Before the checking of the allotted time for each team, may I first verify the team number of both teams? For the prosecutor, your team number is 11, 1, 1. And for the defendants, your team number is 19, 1, 9. If there are no further questions, we will now proceed to check the allotted time for each team. Would the prosecutor please indicate your allotted time for each voter? And would there be any rebuttal time? Good afternoon, Your Excellencies. I am Muta Speaker 1. I will be speaking for 18 minutes. My co-counsel will be speaking for 20 minutes and we reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Your time request has been marked on timekeeping sheet. Would the defendants please indicate your allotted time for each voter? And would there be any sir rebuttal time? Madam Bailiff, the first mooter will speak for 18 minutes, the second for 20 minutes, and consequently we reserve two minutes for sir rebuttals. Thank you. Your time request has been marked on timekeeping sheet. Before we begin, would the judges and both teams please pin the program view at your Zoom display so that you could see the time counts down display. The timer will run according to the time allotted. Are the judges and both teams ready to proceed? The International Criminal Court is now in session. His Excellencies, Kali Chu, Michael Crowley, Stan Edelis Verhoeven, Kirsty Welsh, and Ji Hyun Park presiding. The president of the court is Her Excellency, Carly Chu. The case before the pretrial chamber of the International Criminal Court is the prosecutor against Lucretia Barsino. The prosecutor and the defendant are each allotted 40 minutes to present their pleadings. The audience is reminded to switch up all mobile phones and pages. No photo taking is permitted inside the court. Before we begin, can we check that we can be seen and heard clearly? Much obliged, Your Excellencies. Madam President, Your Excellency, may it please the court. My name is Alyssa Tang, and I appear together with my co-counsel, Ms. Neha Malhotra, as counsel for the prosecution against Ms. Lucretia Bassino. In seeking to confirm the charges, I will be speaking for 18 minutes on the gravity of the case, followed by count one. My co-counsel, Ms. Malhotra, will speak for the next 20 minutes on counts two and three. We respectfully reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Your Excellencies, Lucretia Bassino has been involved in a series of unlawful conduct starting with the unlawful confinement of many pollutes. Now, these crimes stemmed from the fatal combination of Bassino's talents, as well as her continuing involvement with the Bashkizan government. Without her contributions, the deprivation of liberty of many pollutes could have been avoided. It is in line with this fact these facts that the legal issue to be determined by this court today is whether we have sufficient evidence to establish substantial grounds to believe that Bassino is liable for these war crimes. To this end, I make two submissions. First, that the case against Bassino is admissible. Second, that Bassino is liable for the war crime of unlawful confinement under Article 8.2A.7 of the Rome Statute. 
Now, preliminarily, before we go into our submissions, we first note that the defence has argued in their written submissions at paragraph 3 that the accused did not have a high-ranking position in the Bashkazan government and is therefore not most responsible for the crime. Now, Your Excellencies, this is inconsistent with the law as it stands, as there can be multiple people who are most responsible for a crime and no category of perpetrators is per, per se excluded from being brought before this court. This was held in this court's 2006 Taganda decision. Presently, we do not deny the Bashkazan, that the Bashkazan government has played a major role in committing these crimes and that the Bashkazan government is the principal perpetrator. However, Basino herself has acted as an accessory perpetrator and is also one of the most responsible persons for this crime. Accordingly, our office is prosecuting her. Turning to my first submission, that the case against Basino is admissible because the crimes committed were sufficiently grave. Your Excellencies, the gravity assessment under Article 17 d of the Rome Statute involves a holistic evaluation of all relevant quantitative and qualitative aspects of the crimes. This was held in this court's 2020 El Hassan decision. In that case, it was also clarified that the requirement of gravity does not oblige this case to prosecute the gravest cases, but rather serves to exclude cases that are of marginal gravity. Presently, this is not one of such cases. Now, quantitatively, we look at the number of victims, while qualitatively, we look at the skill, nature, and manner of commission of the crimes. We will show this court how these factors are established for all three charges that Bassino faces. Starting with count one, line four of paragraph 14 shows that Pennock monitors large groups of arrestees. Qualitatively, where crimes impact beyond victims over to the population, this would indicate gravity. And this was suggested by this court's chamber in the 2015 Comoros situation. Now, presently, the skill and nature of the confinement effectively silence the Palut's population by suppressing political views that oppose the Bashkazan government. Such an impact on the population makes this crime grave. Next, Eagle Eye resulted in an attack on civilians using heavy weapons, killing 37 persons and injuring 42. Your Excellencies, in this court's 2010 case of Abu Ghada, it was held that 12 deaths and a further attempt to kill eight other persons had met the quantitative threshold. The numbers we are looking at now far surpass the numbers in that case. Furthermore, the manner of commission of the crime for count two is also grave, according to the 2014 Katanga judgment, where this court held that close range killing of civilians demonstrated gravity. Finally, the manner in which the Zillan drone strikes were used to destroy the buildings was grave. As seen in clarification 48 and line 3 of paragraph 27 of the facts, the Zillan drones operate without any human agency and had targeting issues. This eventually caused the indiscriminate attack of the church and sanatorium. Now, these factors indicate that the crimes were sufficiently grave and therefore we say that this case is admissible. Council, a, a question. Uh, well, that is all true. One of the criteria this court also looks at is the role of the accused. Now, Ms. Lucrezia Barcino, she has, of course, a role in 
what happened, but she's not the main perpetrator. She is not the one pulling the trigger. She was not the one locking those people up in their homes. She provided the means, but in light of what happened, does that not, and in light of the fact that most of those instances, the charge two and charge three at least, were not systematic as well. They were almost isolated incidents. In light of those two criteria, would you not say that this case lacks the sufficient gravity? No, Your Excellency. We would not say that this case lacks sufficient gravity. Now, the prosecution is aware that Bassino is not in the same position as the principal perpetrator, the Bashkizan government. And it is because of this that we go after, that we prosecute Bassino as, a, as an accessory perpetrator. Your Excellencies, the Rome Statute, in fact, envisions such form of liability under Article 25.3 of the Rome Statute, such as common purpose liability, co-perpetration. Yes, but Council, sorry to interrupt you. In, yes, it provides for that, but that doesn't mean that um, each and every accessory will be charged. What happens is typically a balance between the role and the scope of the crimes. My problem with this case is that we have only few instances as charge one, sorry, charge two and charge three are both, look both isolated incidents. In both incidents, she had a relatively, well, at least for charge three, you're charging as a perpetrator, but her role does not seem to be the actual carrying out of the crimes. So if you combine everything together, another criterion, intent, did she really want to kill people? Did she really want to walk away people? Again, if you look all of those factors together, and you compare it with other serious crimes where direct the, the perpetrators were directly involved were charged, how can you still argue this case is sufficiently grave? Now, Your Excellency is certainly right to point out that it is not in every case that the accessory perpetrator will be prosecuted or charged. Now, however, what distinguishes Bassino from other what distinguishes Bassino is her continuing involvement with the Bashkazan government and her provision of fatal AI programs. Now, while we acknowledge Your Excellency's point that she may appear remote from the commission of the crime, while when we are assessing her individual criminal responsibility, this court's 2014 Katanga judgment has stated that what is relevant is whether or not her contribution had, effect, had effects on the material realization of these crimes. Now, through the course of our submissions, my co-counsel and I will show this court that there are substantial grounds to believe that Bassino should attract individual criminal responsibility. Now, turning to the merits of the case, we submit that the war crime of unlawful confinement is made out under count one. For this crime, Article 8.2A.7 of the Elements of Crimes lists in total five elements. For our oral submissions, we will only discuss the most contentious elements regarding the existence of an international armed conflict and the unlawful confinement. We defer to our written submissions to establish the remaining elements. I make three points. First, that the conduct took place in the context of an international armed conflict, hereafter referred to as an IAC. Second, that the confinement was unlawful. Third, that Bassino bears individual criminal responsibility for this crime. Now, turning to my first point that the conduct took place in the context of an IAC, we submit that Bashkizan occupied Polotska, a territory of Tavir, by exercising effective control over it. According to Common Article 2 of the Geneva Convention, occupation of another state's territory gives rise to an IAC. Your Excellencies, there is effective control 
where foreign powers exercise authority over the territory concerned in lieu of its local government. And this can be seen, for instance, where a state can control the movement across territory's borders. This was held in the 2003 ICTY case of Nella Tillich and is evident on our present facts. As seen from line four of paragraph five of the facts, the BAF built security fences around Polotska and set up checkpoints at all major roads into the region. In light of this, we submit that Bashkizan has occupied Polotska, a territory of Tavir, and the relevant conduct thus took place in the context of an IAC. However, at the same time, Council, the region was also granted a large amount of autonomy. So how can a government effectively control a region if it also grants at the same time a large amount of autonomy? Now, Your Excellency, we do acknowledge that the Bashkizan government had reached an agreement with the PREP, granting PREP the autonomy to govern Polotska. However, we emphasize that this court has to look at the wider context. Now, immediately in the next line in paragraph 15, apologies, paragraph 5, we see that, the, that nonetheless, the Bashkizan forces still built security fences and even could close off the Polotska region when the PLF had launched attacks. Now, it's in building council, it's building security fences along a region that could be a, again could be a border fence is being able to close off a region is that sufficient to maintain occupation under ihl because for me occupation is where you have at least sizable armed presence within a territory merely sealing a territory merely searing the territory off and having some minor incursions and going out again doesn't look like the standard case of occupation. Now, Your Excellencies, according to the Nella Tillich case, uh, the 2003 ICTY Nella Tillich case, indeed, where armed forces are within the region, this could indicate effective control. However, it is not limited to that. And as we see from the recent 2020 Israel and Palestine case, the where, where states control the territory movements across borders, this would be sufficient to amount to occupation. Now, well, in light of Castle, that case, the 2020 Israel-Palestine case, which court was that before? It was before this court, Your Excellency. All right. Thank you. Now, in light of my time, I turn to address the point on unlawful confinement. And we say that the confinement was unlawful because the arrestees were not confined for imperative reasons of security as required by, the, by Article 78 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Now, we do... Council, because you're running out of time, I'm going to ask your question now. I'm interested in hearing what you say, how this confinement by the government is linked to the accused. Because really, isn't that the issue? Certainly, Your Excellencies. Now, if I may refer this court to paragraph 14 of the facts. Oh, pardon me. Paragraph 13 of the facts. Now, from, from the second line, we see that Pennock was to be used to monitor prisoners who are deemed fit to re-enter society, and such prisoners would be assigned residences with special magnetic locks. Now, we say that it is because Bassino provided Penop, it was precisely this contribution that enabled the Bashkizan government. Judge Crowley, do you... Council, who enforced the confinement? Wasn't the person who made the act, the accused, was the government? So how do we resolve that issue? Indeed, Judge Crawley is right to point out that the Bashkizan government was the main party that enforced the confinement. However, as we have previously submitted, what is relevant here is whether Bassino's contribution had an effect 
on the material realization of the crimes. Now, we submit that her provision of Penop indeed had facilitated the confinement as well as the unlawful manner in which the confinement took place. Now, this is because without Penop, the plan to confine the arrestees simply could not have happened. With Penop, the Bashkazan government was then able to move the arrestees from their overflowing detention facilities to their homes. Now, furthermore... Council, but she didn't provide the locks, did she? It was only the app. Your Excellencies, it would appear that on the facts, it would not suggest that Bassino provided the locks. But simply by virtue of providing this program, the constant monitoring of arrestees was enabled. And this constant monitoring can amount to a deprivation of liberty. Now, therefore, we say that not only did, was her provision a significant contribution, she, would have, she also did so with the knowledge of the Bashkazan government's intentions, given that, she, given that the ongoing situation had attracted wide media coverage, as well as we, as, and also evidence in her promise to optimize PANOP accordingly. Now, unless I may be of further assistance to this court, This concludes my submissions. May it please the court. Thank you, counsel. Your Excellencies, may I begin? Yes, please. Madam President, Your Excellencies, may it please this court. As earlier introduced, my name is Meher Malhotra, and I will be continuing the case for the prosecution. In seeking this court to confirm the charges against Lucretia Barcino, I will be speaking for 20 minutes on count two and count three. Your Excellencies, Lucretia Barcino started off as a founder of a technology company that aided in e-governance through AI. Now, as her engagement grew deeper with Bashkazan, her actions furthered Bashkazan's aim in occupying Polotska. Now, in particular, by developing and adjusting technology such as Eagle Eye and Zillant for BAF's use, she has contributed to the deaths of civilians in the attacks. In light of this, the prosecution makes two submissions. First, as for count two, Lucretia Barcino bears responsibility for the war crime of intentionally directing attacks at civilians who are not taking direct participation in hostilities. Now, second, as for count three, Lucretia Barcino bears responsibility for intentionally directing attacks at protected buildings, which are not military objectives under Article 82B9 of the Rome Statute. I now proceed with my first submission that Barcino bears liability under Article 82B1 of the Rome Statute. Now, in particular, she bears responsibility for the attacks on civilians occurring in the Old Town Plaza. Now, in light of my time, I will be focusing on the most contentious elements, deferring the other elements to my written submissions. Now, with this in mind, we make two points. First, the 250 civilians did not take direct participation in hostilities. Counsel, before you go there, is it still an international armed conflict at that point in time? Because according to the facts, Bashkirzan had lost control over the Polska region. So there is no longer occupation. So how would you qualify the conflict? Because the fighting took place, to be fair, on the territory of Tver, but between the PLF and the Bashkirzan armed forces. So 
would that not be then a non-international armed conflict? Judge Verhoeven, we submit that there is still an international armed conflict, both in count two and count three, because if we look at paragraph 16 of the facts, we see that the president of Tavir announced that the government had decided to go to war with Bashkazan to reunify with Polotska with Tavir. Now, one hour later, Tavir armed forces crossed the border and engaged with the Bashkazan no, armed forces. There's no problems with that, uh, Council. I'm agreeing with that, that there is an international armed conflict. But you could have an international armed conflict together with a non-international armed conflict. So how do we assess? Because if you look at the parties involved in the actual hostilities in the Polotska region, that is the Bashkazan government and the PLF. There are no armed forces of Tver involved. So you could have both an international and a non-international armed conflict at the same time. Now, even if we were to take Your Excellency's position that there is both an IAC and an NIAC occurring, we submit that the conduct that took place was in the context of an IAC. Now, this is because the attacks on the civilians were due to the fact that the civilians were supporting PLF, which is a party that supports the reunification with Tavir. And hence, we would submit that the conduct still occurs or takes place in the context of an IAC. Now, moving on to my first point, we submit that the 250 civilians did not directly participate in the hostilities. Now, Your Excellencies, the defense has essentially taken the position in their written submissions at paragraph 26 that the civilians blocking off important areas can lose their protection against armored attacks as they are directly engaging in the hostilities. Now, while certain commentaries, such as the 2009 ICRC interpretive guidance on the notion of direct participation in hostilities does provide blocking as an example of direct participation, this cannot be a blanket rule, as civilians are only said to be directly participating in the hostilities if their actions satisfy three conjunctive elements. Now, first, if their actions are likely to adversely affect the military operations of a party to the armed conflict. Second, if there is a direct causal link between the act and the adverse effect. And third, if the act is specifically designed to directly cause the adverse effect in support of a party and to the detriment of another. Now, these elements are listed in the interpretive guidance, and we contest on the first element. Now, Your Excellencies, as to the first element, whether there is a likelihood of adverse effects, the emphasis here is on likelihood as opposed to the actual materialization of harm. And this must be seen in light of the prevailing circumstances of the case. Now, in our present case, we submit that the blocking of the plaza was not likely to adversely affect BAF's operations because of the amenability of the civilians and the likelihood of evacuation given the success of previous negotiations. Now, starting from paragraph 20, line four of the facts, we see that the civilians previously participated in non-violent protests. Now, although they had set up barricades, we see in the same paragraph at line three, and I quote, that BAF convinced the civilians to leave the barricades peacefully. Now, this was despite contrary instructions given to the civilians by the PLF pamphlets. Yes, Judge Welsh, do you have a question? Now, if we just... Thank you, Councillor. Sorry for the, the delay there. Um, no so worries. Actually, 
My, my question is more related to the intention to direct attacks against the civilian population. So knowing that there were measures taken and assessments undertaken by the programme to determine these this population a threat, regardless of whether they are a uh, whether they are directly participating in hostilities or not. The fact that that process, that safeguard was in place, does that not really tell us that there was no actual intention? Perhaps mistakes were made, but can you can you tell us why we should believe there was an intention to attack the civilian population? Judge Welch, can I clarify if this is in relation to Barcino's intention or BAF's intention? Council, do you, do you think it's materially different to the, the conclusion that we would reach? It certainly is, Judge Welch, and this is because the intention required under the war crime itself is different from the intention required under the Article 25.3c in which we are prosecuting Barcino under. So if we are going under Barcino's intention, then we would submit that the issues regarding Eagle Eye would show that she was aware in the ordinary course of events that the criminal consequences, which were the attacks on the civilians directly not directly participating in the hostilities, would occur. Now, if we're talking about BAF's intention, then we would submit that BAF knew that these civilians were not taking direct participation in hostilities and still decided to possess the will to attack them. Now, this is because of the fact that BAF entered the plaza with the intention of only targeting PLF fighters. Now, knowing that these civilians were involved in certain protests and even negotiating with them, they knew that these civilians were not taking direct participation in hostilities, yet still uh, use them as the object of the attack. In council, what about the throwing of the stones? They were throwing stones. Uh, the Lieutenant Vasily Petrov was harmed in that event. So that could be maybe considered direct participation hostilities. Now, certainly, um, Judge Verhoeven, we do acknowledge your concern that these civilians were throwing stones at the armored vehicles. However, we submit that this is an act of self-defense. Now, this is because in the ICRC interpretive guidance, it mentions that actions that are provided in self-defense are not indicative of a person taking direct participation in the hostilities. And hence, we submit here- Impossible, but it's very nice for us to state here after the facts. You have to imagine yourself sitting inside the tank in the armored personnel carrier. Suddenly, you have 200 very angry civilians starting to throw rocks. Maybe they want to attack, climb inside, and so on. So if you are the gunner and your targeting system states that there are threats all around you, you hear the rocks pelting uh, at your vehicles, your lieutenant is injured. It's under, they made a mistake, it's understandable mistake maybe, but that shows that there maybe was no intention to kill civilians. And if there's an intention, no intention to kill civilians, there is no war crime in this case. Now, Judge Verhoeven, we do understand that we have to look at the holistic assessment of the facts. Now, we do note that the civilians were throwing stones at the armored vehicles, but just before that, we see that the reason why they were throwing stones was because the BAF armored vehicles fired at an attack at the civilian building behind them. And after seeing this, the civilians decided to throw stones at the armored vehicles. Now, coupled with that, we see that the BAF was familiar with these civilians. These were the civilians that were negotiating with them in the plaza and were asking them for a peaceful evacuation. And hence, we would submit that BAF, knowing these circumstances, would know that these civilians are not military threats and should not be attacked. Now, despite this, they still decided to, decided to fire 
at the civilians. Now, Your Excellency. So they decided to open fire because of the information they received from the Eagle Eye software, correct? So my question is more to do with the intent of the soldiers. Was there a intent to commit the conduct of attacking civilians, or was there just a terrible mistake that based on the software, they were identified as threats, as a result, the fire was opened. This could maybe be a war crime, but not necessarily the war crime of intentionally directing attacks against civilians. You have to prove that the purpose was to kill civilians or to attack civilians. Not that it was a mistake. Now, Your Excellency, we do understand that the gunners were relying on Eagle Eye to identify the military threats. However, Your Excellencies, if we look at Clarifications 32, we also see that the gunners were relying on other equipment as well, such as optical sensors as well as periscopes to determine the situation. Now, knowing as well that Eagle Eye was prone to error in the sense that it could not identify in large, it made issues in identifying in larger groups, we submit that the gunners here would not really have, pardon me, the gunners would have intended to believe that these civilians were not taking direct participation in hostilities, it still made the people the object of the attack. Now, in light of my time, I will be moving on to my second and final submission regarding Barcino's liability under Article 8.2b9 of the Rome Statute. Now, in particular, Your Excellencies, we make one point, which is that Barcino is liable as a co-perpetrator under Article 25.3a of the Rome Statute. Now, Your Excellencies, we submit in particular that she possesses the requisite mental element, that she was aware in the ordinary course of events that the attacks on the protected buildings would occur. Now, Your Excellencies, to illustrate this mental element threshold, we look towards this court's 2021 decision of Ongwen, where the accused was aware in the ordinary course of events through having awareness of his features of his organization, that his recruits were not taught to distinguish between civilians and combatants or between civilian objects and military objects. Now, likewise, Your Excellencies, in our present case, seen Uncle, from- Uncle, interrupt you. What was the charge in Ongwen? Your Excellency, Ongwen was being charged as an indirect co-perpetrator. No, I'm sorry. I mean, let me, let me rephrase. What was the war crime charged in that case? Your Excellency, Ongwen was being charged for 70 counts on different war crimes as well as different crimes against humanity. Now, under this particular 2021 decision, he was charged as an indirect co-perpetrator for these war crimes and crimes against humanity. But okay, let me rephrase again because there is an issue here. Again, you have to prove that there was an intention to attack those buildings. All right. So, depending on the war crime, you may have different mental elements. So, hence my question was what if you refer to the mental element, what was the war crime in the context of which that statement was made? Now, Judge Verhoeven, to be an indirect co-perpetrator, the, uh, the intention required is different for the war, from the war crime. Now, for an indirect co-perpetrator, one must be aware in the ordinary course of events that a criminal consequence would occur. Now, we submit that this level of intention is the same as what Barcino is being charged in the first place. Now, here, Bar Barcino must be aware in the ordinary course of events that the protected buildings would be the object of the attack. And we say so on the basis of two facts. First, Your Excellencies, seen from Clarifications 46, on 21st August 2020, less than two weeks before Zillin's operationalization, Barcino was informed 
by her software engineers that Zilland faced certain issues regarding the software. Now, in particular, and I quote, Zilland AI struggled to make decisions in situations when the identified target was not clearly a military objective or a civilian one. Now, the defense has argued in their written submissions at paragraph 43 that Barcino ordered a patch to deal with Zillant and instructed the software engineers to continuously patch the drone if needed. However, Your Excellencies, if we look at Clarifications 46, on 1st September 2020, Barcino received an internal memo by her software engineers expressing doubts regarding the effectiveness of the patch. However, despite this, the very next week, on 8 September 2020, Zillant was operationalized for use. Council, now, in- Council, can I just stop you there? But the accused didn't fly the drone and didn't fire the drone and you've charged her as a perpetrator. I don't quite see what I should do with that. Could you assist me there? Because it seems to me that the fact that the patch didn't work properly is just what happened. It doesn't mean the drone had to fire anyhow. Someone still has to release the drone and send it on its way. And where is the evidence that she is directly linked to where the drone is going to fly? Yeah, also, um, also, in addition to that, wasn't she intended to um, make a software to distinguish Chibelia from the uh, combatants? Because the software, uh, um, the Eagle Eye, had a 10 seconds uh, to abort. And also the Zealand, uh, they are uh, making the software, but uh, that was uh, developing on the process of developing. So wasn't the software was uh, trying to distinguish? Answering Judge Crawley's question first regarding how Barcino, Your Excellency, first I note that my time is up. Uh, May I answer both? Judge Crawley's question and Judge Park's question. Um, yes, counsel, uh, you, you would have an additional one minute for that purpose. Certainly. Now, starting with Judge Crawley's question on why she is a perpetrator, we submit here that she is being charged under Article 253A as a direct co perpetrator. Now, for this, the, perp- the co perpetrator must provide an essential contribution to the crime. Now, Your Excellencies, while we do note she has not controlled the drone as to where it flies, she has definitely developed a technology and programmed this technology with a very wide target profile that facilitates an indiscriminate attacks. Now, in particular, Your Excellencies, we see that the Zillant drones did not have a human agency and hence cannot make a judgment as to whether a building is a military objective or not. Hence, we submit that she has still the essential contribution to the crime. Now, answering Judge Park's question, we submit that although the original purpose was regard... May I just answer Judge uh, Park's question, Uh, Madam President? You have 10 seconds to do that. Certainly. Now... Although the original purpose was to distinguish, we note that in the, in the course of the events, the target profile was indiscriminate in nature and was wide enough that it didn't follow the original purpose of distinguishing. And hence, we submit that Barcino is still liable as a co-perpetrator. Now, I note my time, and I thank Madam President for the extension. Now, unless I may be of any further assistance to this court, this concludes the prosecution submissions. May it Thank please you. the court.
Yes, counsel for the defendant, uh, if you're ready, you may start. Before I begin, I'd just like to remark to Judge Park, um, if you raised your hand, it doesn't show up on the pin, on the program view. So please uh, feel free to interrupt us as we speak. Uh, with that, I shall begin. Madam President, your honors, may it please the court. My name is Dylan Jesse Andrea, and along with my learned co-counsel, Ms. Ida Latifa, we plead on behalf of Ms. Lucretia Barcino. Now, your honors, this is a unique case because the prosecution has decided to target a person who merely provides the technology that resulted in the commission of the crime. And this is unique, that provided technology. For example, the Rwandan genocide committed by the Interhamwe. The persons who provided the arms to these persons to commit that genocide, they were not held responsible. The committing, uh, uh, the shooting of the Bogoro village by Bemba, the persons who provided them weapons were never held responsible. And why is this? The reason for this is contained in Article 36 of Additional Protocol 1, that when we have weapons, the obligation is on the high contracting party to ensure that it is IHL compliant, not the person who provides the technology. And so, Your Honors, we submit the court should keep this in mind, that even though the mere unfortunate fact that the technology Ms. Barcino meant to better the world with became tangled up in conduct resulting in tragedy, that that should not be the sole catalyst for automatically attributing responsibility to Ms. Barcino. Counsel, fair enough, but there have been cases where the people who provided the means have been held accountable, maybe not by the ICC or the ICY, but there have been national cases where this happens. So it's maybe true of it, it maybe refers to the issue of um, admissibility and the severity and the gravity of the case, but it's not necessarily true that you can never hold a person accountable for this. That's true, Your Honor. Within the larger context of international criminal law or criminal law in general, if a person provides the means for the commission of the crime, then yes, they can be held responsible. But when it comes to providing the means with respect to new technology, that's the precise term used by additional protocol one, the responsibility is with the contracting state. It is always with the high contracting state. And so ultimately, it should be the Ministry of Defense and not just the Ministry of Defense, but the commanders on the ground and the soldiers on the ground who ensure that not only the weapon itself is IHL compliant, but that its use is also IHL compliant. And we submit this will be reflected. Yes, Your Counsel, Honor. that's not a fixed rule. There's no reason why someone who supplies equipment that is used improperly cannot be held responsible for it. And she had a choice in count one in particular, she had a choice not to provide the equipment. So hasn't, by making that choice and providing the pan-op equipment, she's exposed herself to potential litigation. Well, Your Honor, if we're determining whether or not she is responsible, uh, from a, a, an opinionated point of view, we might think that, yes, she did make a contribution to the crime. But according to this court, the standard that we apply is one of a significant contribution and whether this contribution was made with intent and knowledge. And when we do turn to those submissions, we will prove that the contribution was not made within the context of Article 25.3D of the Rome Statute, and furthermore, that it was not made with the requisite intent and knowledge. But before I turn to that, I shall address the preliminary issue of admissibility raised by the prosecution then I shall turn to the nature of conflict, which I submit does not give rise to the war crimes as submitted by the office of the prosecutor. And then finally, that Ms. Barcino is not individually criminally responsible for the war crime of unlawful confinement under Article 8 to A7 of the Rome Statute. Now, with respect to inadmissibility, the prosecution has submitted that it is not necessary for us to target the most senior leaders in any given situation under investigation. And they've said because that would not be consistent with Article 25.3c of the Rome Statute. However, we have to remind this course that when we look at admissibility, we're not looking at the individual case. We're looking at the situation at large, whether the persons within the situation are the most are the persons that are the most senior leaders. Now, with respect to the situation of Polotska, the only person being targeted is Ms. Barcino, and she is certainly not a senior leader. She has no position in the Bashkazan government, government, and she had no role in the violence. And the term role in the violence is this explicit wording of this court's Kenya authorization of an investigation. And so for that reason, 
because this situation does not target the most senior leaders in the situation, and the term most senior leaders is taken from this court's Democratic Republic of the Congo application of arrest warrant, paragraph 50, then this case is not of the sufficient gravity to justify further action by this court. Now, having addressed that preliminary issue of admissibility, but counsel, counsel, but if the accused provides a means for these senior people to commit war crimes, then surely she's an aider and a better at the very least. Well, Your Honor, we will turn to that uh, eventually. But with respect to admissibility, we don't look at whether the person is an aider or a better. That is, that, is a, that is an issue to be dealt with in the merits of the case, provided that the case is admissible to begin with. And so we would submit just looking at inadmissibility, the case is inadmissible because she's not one of the most senior leaders. But we will, of course, address whether or not she can be considered an aider or a better or a person who significantly contributes to a group crime. But with respect to the nature of conflict, we can test the prosecution's characterization of this conflict as being an occupation that gives rise to an international armed conflict. Now, the reason why we would say this is we would refer this court to the ICRC 2016 commentary to Common Article 2, paragraph 304. And paragraph 304 says that there are three cumulative, cumul cumulative conditions that need to be met in order to establish a state of occupation. And principal among those conditions is the requirement that, and I'm going to read this exactly, the armed forces of a state are physically present in a foreign territory. Now, we understand that the, the prosecution has contested this uh, on two grounds. First, they have contested this by citing the 2003 ICTY Naletilic case. And they've said that in Naletilic, just being in the borders constitutes effective control. Now, we would contest this for two reasons. The first being that these are merely guidelines for determining the existence of effective control. This does not prove without a shadow of a doubt, that there is an effective control. Now, another thing that we'd like to mention is that this case, and this was uh, mentioned by the prosecutor, was delivered in 2003. And this did not take into account the events of 2005, in which Israel withdrew its troops from Gaza and stationed itself around the border. And now there was a new question, whether if Israel were to surround the border of Gaza, does that constitute military occupation? And the prevailing view of scholars I mean, is no... Uh, counsel, um, but the commentary is also notes that if it's feasible, if it's reasonably possible to exercise authority in a reasonable amount of time, you could still have a territory under occupation. So it's not necessary that you have troops stationed at each and every place. If you're capable to rapidly, again, take control over the territory, you still could have occupation. Well, Your Honor, we would respectfully disagree for the reason provided in the commentary. Uh, the commentary takes the, takes the view that the armed forces have to be present in, in the territory so that the occupying power can discharge its obligations under occupation law. So if we look at Article 47 to 78 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, there are certain obligations the occupying power has to adhere to. It has to administer the territory, for example, by providing humanitarian aid, providing food or water where necessary, ensuring that these persons can communicate with the outside world. Now, if the enemy forces, if the armed forces are not in the territory, how are they able to do that? And that's why there is that strict requirement that the enemy forces are in the territory. And that's why the prevailing view of scholars is that the situation in Gaza does not constitute an occupation because Israel is merely surrounding the borders, but is not able to carry out its obligations as an occupying power because its enemy forces aren't in the territory itself. But whether that will be, make it easy for an occupying power who wants to get rid of its obligations just to get across the border, put all its troops there, and at the first sight of a problem, just quickly move in, pacify the region, go out again, say, look, we have no more obligation as an occupying power. We are no longer an occupying power. That sounds me to me a bit too easy, don't you think? It certainly does sound too easy, Your Honor. But that doesn't mean that this is a state of occupation. That could mean that this is something else entirely. This could be an illegal incursion into territory that does not belong to the state. But that doesn't automatically mean that it is an occupied territory. Now, the final point we'd like to make uh, on, this, on this point is the prosecution has referred to the 2020 Palestine decision. 
And uh, they've not cited which document it is exactly. So we've had to recourse to the written memorials. But they've cited in paragraph, in footnote 17, the document from 16 March 2020. Now, Your Honors, it's worth noting that the 16 March 2020 document is not this court's decision. It is an amicus curiae brief requested by this court. And so this is not the view of the court. This was a request made by the court to legal experts as to the situation in Palestine. Now, on top of that, this court's decision, which was delivered on 5 February 2021, did not deal with the question of whether Palestine was an occupied territory. Instead, the question the, the court answered there was whether Palestine is firstly a state and whether, if it is a state, this court has territorial jurisdiction over that territory. And Your Honors, we have perused that uh, decision in its entirety. And the court never calls this territory occupied uh, beyond 1967. So they've always very carefully referred to it as the occupied territories since 1967. And the reason for this, we would presume, is because there is still this controversy surrounding whether this territory is still occupied following... I mean, then a follow-up question. Um, if we now set aside the situation in Israel for a moment, what about the police force? The police force in the Polotska region was still under the control of the Ministry of Interior, of the government of Bashkizan. So the fact that you have a police force of a foreign entity that is maintaining peace and security in that region, could that not be sufficient to have occupation? Again, that's not the case for the situation in the Gaza Strip. So at least there's a very important distinction here, don't you think? Your Honor, we do agree that there is an important distinction, uh, and that's particularly, uh, and we do agree with the courts. We're also concerned whether or not the police force could constitute a, an enemy force within the meaning of the commentary of the ICRC, uh, uh, within the meaning of the 2016 ICRC commentary. And so we looked further into the, the 2016 commentary, and we noted that they cited the work of Dr. Tristan Ferraro. Now, Dr. Tristan Ferraro was of the view that uh, the, the presence of a police department in that territory does not constitute an occupation. And the reason is that the military is functionally hierarchically different from a police department. The, the armed forces are specifically trained and equipped to deal with the laws of war, in particular, the law of occupation. And so it would only be where the enemy forces, the armed forces, are present in the, in the territory, where they're stationed there and where they carry out the obligation as an occupying power, can this territory be delineated an occupied territory. Hmm. Consequently... Really like, sorry to interrupt, but uh, for the uh, physical presence you are saying is that the commentary actually required to have a physical presence at the time of invasion later it can be changed well your honor uh, we submit that that was the older view but the commentary has changed that the enemy forces must still be present in the territory and that's the view in the 2016 commentary we'd refer the courts to paragraph 304 if the court would like to investigate for it hmm. uh, the prosecution has also mentioned that there was a bash design to veer armed conflict uh, but with respect to counts two and three we submit there wasn't a nexus between the conduct in counts two and three and the Bashkizan to armed conflict. Indeed, all of the conduct took place against either the PLF or their supporters. And so what the prosecution has to establish is not that the Bashkizan to armed conflict was an international armed conflict, but that the Bashkizan PLF armed conflict was an international armed conflict. And therefore, that would satisfy that requirement. But in the absence of that, we would submit that this situation is not an international armed conflict giving rise to the war crimes as submitted by the Office of the Prosecutor under Article 82A and 82B of the Rome Statute. Also, what about resistance movements in occupied territories? Again, this was very common in World War II, where you had a lot of armed groups resisting the occupiers, although they were not state organs. They had no direct control, or the state had no direct control of them. Yet, if you look at Article 4 of the Third Geneva Convention, those groups can, under certain conditions, benefits from prisoner of war status, which means they take part in international armed conflict. So why is the PLF not one of those movements? Well, Your Honor, we recognize that uh, Article 4 of the Third Geneva Convention talks about whether uh, a person can belong to another party in the conflict. And we would note that in Tadic, this court held that that's a, uh, the ICTY held that that's a good starting point for determining whether this group 
belongs to the party in conflict. But that's not the end. The court would go on to discuss in the, the 30 paragraphs to follow, uh, what is the level of control required? And the court finally settled on the fact that there had to be an overall control by the state to the, to the armed conflict over this armed group. And your honors, the, the fulfillment or the requirement of overall control is not fulfilled. The state of Tavir did not have a role in planning or organizing the military operations of Tavir. They dropped weapons into Polotska once, but that doesn't meet the threshold of overall control. And consequently, this cannot be considered an international armed conflict. Now, seeing that the, the interests of the bench are mostly with whether Ms. Barcino is responsible for the war crime, I shall turn to that uh, briefly. Now, the defense has submitted, or rather the prosecution has submitted, responsi responsibility arises where there is a material effect on the, on the crime. Now, we would disagree with that because that would make the threshold too low. Indeed, the threshold when we assess responsibility is one of a significant contribution pursuant to this court's Marushimana confirmation of the charges, paragraph 277. Now, why do we ask for a significant contribution? Well, according to this court, um, there are many instances where members of a community provide contributions to a criminal organization in the knowledge of the group's criminality, especially where that criminality is public knowledge. Without some threshold level of assistance, every landlord, every grocer, every utility provider, every secretary, every janitor, or even every taxpayer who does anything which contributes to a group committing international crimes could satisfy the elements of 25-3D liability. Counsel, counsel, but... Let's just look at count one. The confinement is really supported by the app supplied by the accused. Yes, we got the locks. I agree that they are not supplied by her. But the whole basis of this confinement, the monitoring of the citizens, are the app that she provided. Surely that is significant contribution. And counsel would like to add as well that she had to change the software because the app was originally not meant for this kind of people. So to put together, that shows to me significance. Well, Your Honor, uh, prima facie, we would agree that this would seem significant. But according to this court, the factors we, we apply when we assess the significance is whether the accused creates or executes the criminal plan, the position of the person concerned relative to the group, and the role the suspect played vis-a-vis -vis the seriousness and scope of the crimes committed. Now, with respect to the position, she was not part of the Bashkizan government. With respect to the, the position, uh, with respect to whether she created or executed the criminal plan, it was Bashkizan that came up with the plan. And in the words of the, the bench, uh, it was them that uh, put on the locks on the doors. And with respect to the role she played vis-a-vis -vis the seriousness and scope of the crimes, this looks at whether she could have prevented the commission of the crimes. And your honors, she was not able to do so. The Bashkizan government asked her to do this. And uh, with respect to the handing over of data, for example, when she chose not to, they threatened her with a court order saying, if you don't do this, then we'll take you to litigation. She could have elected not to hand it over. Uh, Council, you may have uh, an additional one minute to answer the question. And, and I also have a question for you. So uh, additional one minute. Thank you, your honor. Uh, it appears that she could have, or, or it, it appears as if she did have that ability, that decision. However, we would remind the courts that in facts 10, her cooperation was only secured through threats of a court order. Yes, and so Counsel, I'd like to deal with um, count two, because you've seen that uh, she, in fact, uh, milit provided a militarized version, and she also tested it uh, with features of the PLF. So, so how would you say uh, on these facts about her contribution? Uh, Madam President, this is with respect to count two? Yes. Uh, well, I, I would note, first of all, that count two is effectively without my jurisdiction. That is with oh, my co-counsel. But I can answer this question, Madam President. Um, the answer is the required mode of liability is 25-3C of the Rome statute. That is for the purpose of facilitating the crime. That means Ms. Barcino had to act with the purpose she had wanted intended for this to happen. Now the facts are clear. The reason why the Bashkazan government asked for her help was to distinguish between civilians and combatants. This does not reflect purpose within Article 25.3c of the Rome Statute. This concludes my submissions before the yes, Madam President. Yes, I'm about to tell you that your time is up. Thank you for uh, your submission. Thank you. May it please the court.
Yes, um, Council Two, if you're ready, please proceed. Madam President, your honors, may it please the court. My name is Ida Latifa, and for the next 20 minutes, I shall address charges two and three on behalf of the defendant, Mrs. Lucretia Barcina. As our submissions will go on to demonstrate, the prosecution has misplaced responsibility, circumventing an entire military hierarchy, which should be responsible in this regard, and instead targeting an innocent person and institution who merely developed and provided technology to suit the requests made by the Bashkazan. To this end, we submit this following, that the war crime of intentionally directing attacks against civilians, not taking direct part in hostilities pursuant to Article 8 b one of the Rome Statute, along with the war crime of intentionally directing attacks against protected objects, which are not a military objective pursuant to Article 8 b nine of the Rome Statute, have both not occurred, and that in any case, Bersino does not incur individual criminal responsibility. Now moving to my first submission to address the war crime under Article 8 b one Here, I will split my submission into two parts, first to address the missing material elements and then addressing criminal responsibility. Here, we submit that the war crime has not occurred due to the fact that two required elements are missing. First, because the object of attack were in fact civilians taking direct part in hostilities. And secondly, in any case with regards to the status of the civilians, the perpetrator did not intend to make civilians the object of attack. Now, regarding the status of the civilians themselves, Here, the defense also relies on the ICRC interpretive guide as has been submitted by the prosecution. Here, we remind the court that there are three criteria that must be met, namely the belligerent nexus, the threshold of harm, and the direct causation. Now, here we submit that the 250 civilians involved in blockading the Old Town Plaza had in fact been taking direct part in hostilities. Now, we understand that the prosecution has chosen to address the throwing of stones. However, we will still address these elements in regards to the blockading of the plaza before then moving to address the submissions made by the prosecution. Now, first we invite the court to note that the act of blockading the plaza should be regarded the same with all other barricades around the city, as it was evident in the same PLF pamphlets that the intent and purpose behind erecting these barricades was to stall the advancement of the Bashkazan armed force. This would then mean that any barricade or blockade anywhere within the region of Polotska would achieve the goal of the PLF and would in turn establish the belligerent nexus. Now to address the act of blockading the plaza, first in regards to the causation of an adverse effect towards the enemy military operation. Here we submit that the blockade did adversely affect the military operation as it prevented and obstructed the Bashkazan's access to, in order to retake control over Polotska. I have a problem with that argument. Says, even if you would consider that the blocking itself would be direct participation, Citizens, uh, civilians can only be targeted as long as they directly participate. So at that moment, when they start to negotiate to let the troops occupy the place, are they still participating at that point in time in the hostilities? Assuming that we consider the blocking to be directly part, uh, participation in hostilities. For me, it sounds strange that negotiating to evacuate can be considered direct participation in hostilities. Your Honor, with regards to the direct participation in hostilities and with regards to specifically the element of adversely affecting the military uh, operation, uh, the act of negotiating in this case would still constitute that these persons were directly participating in hostilities because the facts do not indicate that for the time that they were negotiating that they then stopped uh, blockading the Old Town Plaza. And with regards to that, uh, we could make the inference here that the persons who were negotiating were not all 250 civilians at the time. And thus this blockade and this uh, obstructing of the access towards the Polotskan region was still very much apparent and it still then very much uh, adversely affected the enemy military operation. And Council, again, I'm trying to follow your logic because if indeed those 200 people were at that point in time directly participating in hostilities, it would mean that those troops could have immediately opened fire and killed them all, injured them all. Again, they are part directly participating in hostilities. For me, it would be very hard to argue that you can kill 200 or more people for merely being on the square 
while they are negotiating to evacuate that square, that you can still open fire at that point in time. Your Honor, with regards to uh, negotiating in this case, we submit that this still, again, does not make that difference because they were, in fact, still blockading the plaza. But with regards to the gunners being able to open fire on all 250 civilians, we would make that submission that this was possible. Uh, and that is due to the fact that the civilians deliberately put themselves in the situation and acted with the intent of blockading the plaza and blockading the military operation. However, as evident in the facts, the gunners here did not resort to that, Your Honors. The gunners here actually waited and the gunners uh, only targeted those civilians who were proven to be a threatening in regards to eagle eyes identification. As such, uh, even if that was possible, they still did not recourse to that and it would then in turn, uh, in regards to the second element, to disprove their intention. Now, with regards to uh, still the blockading itself, uh, we could make the additional submission that with regards to facts 21, there was PLF fighter uh, evident with an RPG in the building behind the civilians. And sub supplemented by fact 17, PLF fighters easily blended in with the civilians. Now, in light of these circumstances, Your Honors, the presence of this large group of persons would provide cover for the PLF, or at the very least, give them time to carry out an attack. Here then, allowing for a direct and material harm to occur in regards to this attack. Now, with the regards to the claim that the civilians would peacefully leave the plaza, as has been submitted by the prosecution, the facts do not support the statement. We submit that the very fact that these civilians remained in the plaza despite being faced with armored vehicles and even after a shot had been directed towards the building behind them would in fact prove the contrary, that the civilians deliberately placed themselves in the way of the armed force and acted with the intent to stop the Bashkas and armed forces military operation, thus fulfilling that first element of the threshold of harm. With regards to the second element, we submit that the belligerent nexus is fulfilled because the blockade was, in fact, a result of the request made by the PLF calling for civilian support and maintaining control over Polotska by stalling the Bashkizan Armed Forces uh, uh, advancement. Now, with regards to the direct causal link, we submit that this does exist because the only disruption faced by the Armed Force during this operation was, in fact, the blockade in the Old Town Plaza. Now, as all elements have been fulfilled, it can be said that all 250 civilians taking part in the uh, blockade itself had taken direct part in hostilities. Now to respond to the act of throwing stones that has been submitted by the prosecution, here we make the submission that the civilians would have already lost their protection during the throwing of stones. Now per article 13, subparagraph three of additional protocol two, civilian protection is lost for the entire duration that civilians take direct part in hostilities. Thus, because the civilians barricaded the plaza prior to the throwing of stones and still barricaded it during the throwing of stones, the conduct of throwing stones would fall within the duration that they were taking direct part in hostilities. And as such, your honors, their protection would have been lost at this time. Thus, disproving the first element required here. Now, even if the court is not with us with regard to the classification of these civilians, we submit that the gunners did not intend to make civilians the object of attack. Now, with regards to intent, Article 30 of the Rome Statute encompasses two forms. Firstly, direct intent, where the perpetrator must have meant to engage in the conduct. And secondly, indirect intent, requiring virtual certainty or that it was impossible for the perpetrator not to imagine that their conduct will result in the commission of a crime. Now, before addressing whether the gunners had virtual certainty a crime would be committed, it is imperative that we recall the facts of the case that have been provided. First, the PLF notoriously hid among civilians before and after attacks to shield themselves from the Bashkazan. Secondly, Eagle Eye had no history of malfunctioning both during the testing stage and when it was used in the field. In fact, Clarification 29 provides that Eagle Eye never killed or never resulted in civilian casualties. Turning then to the situation that we are called on to consider here. We submit to the court that before the gunners even opened fire, Eagle Eye had detected a threat from the building behind the civilians. We further remind the court that in all the haze and commotion in which the civilians began throwing stones at the armed vehicles, the gunners did not open fire 3.5 seconds after threat identification as they usually would. Here, your honors, they stayed calm and waited eight seconds before opening fire. Now we do understand that the court may view that an additional 4.5 seconds is insignificant but we have to consider the circumstances that these gunners were in. They were faced with an enormous crowd throwing hundreds of stones in their direction. 
Now, even if the stones could not have harmed the armed force in this case, we need to keep in mind that this all took in place with the impending danger that there was a PLF fighter present with an RPG, which this PLF fighter with this RPG has evidently damaged and destroyed these armored vehicles and whose bullets, your honors, could easily reach the gunners within a split second. Now, in light of all of these circumstances, to answer the question, did these gunners have the virtual certainty that inevitably their act would result in the death of civilians? We submit here that the answer is no, your honors. And as such, the gunners did not... I mean, on the other hand, the, the, the vehicles had other means of threat identification than Eagle Eye software. There were periscopes, there were optical sensors, there were vision slits. There are other people in the tank or in the armored vehicle that have maybe better situational awareness and that indeed probably only see a group of people throwing rocks without any danger to the vehicles. Still, they decided to open fire from a close distance. They therefore knew that in the ordinary course of events, civilians would be targeted, again, assuming they are civilians. So I would agree with you if this would be like a software that identifies a target from a very long distance and you open fire and you accidentally kill a civilian, I could follow here. But for close up with other people that could watch what is going on, other ways of, of clarifying situation, still opening fire, maybe that shows the intention. Yes, and if I may interrupt to say also, as you've mentioned, there were exact eight seconds of interval. Uh, Your Honor, with regards to uh, the other operational slits or the uh, other vision slits, we make the submission that these other for forms of technology only provided situational awareness. It only showed what was going on outside of the outside of the vehicles. It still required the gunner's analysis to make uh, to make out whether or not these civilians were in fact uh, lawful to be attacked. Now, with regards to that. Uh, in, on the contrary, Eagle Eye here already pointed that, that out for them. Uh, on top of gaining that situational awareness, on top of looking at what was going on outside, Eagle Eye would make the target for them, Your Honors. And in this case, the gunners had only only had to press a button. So uh, in regards to that, Eagle Eye, we, we submit here, would have been the best course of action to take in regards to uh, ensuring that the uh, objects of attack would only have been those lawful to be attacked. And I would cancel the our forces of Bashkazan knew of the problems with Eagle Eye for large groups. They were informed of that. In that case, should the gunners not have been more careful if they really wanted to avoid opening fire on civilians? You know the targeting software has issues, but you still open fire knowing very well that perhaps a lot of them are civilians. With regards to that, Your Honor, facts 18, uh, paragraph 18 of the facts only provides that Eagle Eye would take more time and may become overloaded. In this regard, the facts do not uh, show us or it does not provide us with a definition of what overload could mean. Now, in this case, we submit that the gunners had already taken that information and that warning provided to them into account, evidenced by the fact that they did, in this case, allow more time for Eagle Eye to be able to analyze the situation and pick out a target. In such cases, because they have taken that warning uh, into account, it would disprove their intent in regards to this war crime. Now, having addressed the war crime, I shall move to address criminal responsibility of aiding, abetting, or otherwise assisting the commission of a war crime. Now, here, your honors, we contest the element of purpose that it, this cannot in any way be established in this case. Now, Article 25.3c of, uh, of the Rome Statute requires that the person act for the purpose of facilitating the commission of the crime. Now, the chamber in Bemba has explained that purpose means that the perpetrator desired for the crime to occur and that one's conduct in assisting the commission of the crime is uh, one's knowledge that their conduct of assisting the crime would result in the principal offense is not sufficient to establish purpose. Now, paragraph 18 of the facts have clarified that Bar Barcino in this case was approached with the purpose of distinguishing civilians from PLF fighters. Thus, her purpose of providing eagle eye cannot be then to target civilians instead of the combatants, as that would not match with why, the reason why... Uh, the, reason the, council, why the council, surely it was within her contemplation that this distinguishing civilians from soldiers, there was going to be an issue there. 
With regards to that, Your Honor, we make the submission that it still would not prove her purpose or intent because that exact information and uh, in regards to that, all information in regards to Eagle Eye and all of its simulations had been provided to the, uh, to the Bashkazan Armed Force, Your Honor. So in this case, uh, that contemplation would not prove her intent. In regards to uh, here, it, it would far more prove the intent of the Bashkazan in regards to uh, committing this crime. Because uh, again, she had provided them with the warning that this should not be used in these kinds of situations, that there would be a decrease of performance. As such, that would not uh, be evident of her intent, Your Honor. Now, with regards to purpose, uh, we then, then again, um, may I, um, you know, although the PF, uh, PLF fighters, they have used the uh, uh, distinctive emblem of PLF during the movement of uh, wounded, uh, wouldn't the drone has to um, have a capacity to distinguish when they're in an experimental phase? But for 10 days, they use a drone, but they could not make a distinction. Uh, therefore, they killed unknown number of patients, even though there was uh, some mistake in, uh, done by the PLF using the uh, emblem in a different ways. But the AI could have known it. Your Honor, with regards to that, I do believe uh, that Your Honor is referring to the third charge in regards to Zilant, the drone here. Um, with regards to that, we make the submission that uh, having these uh, objectives in mind or these kinds of criteria on what Zilant does operate on and does make its targeting uh, would not prove or her intention still in this case. As she, again, as I will further prove, she did order patches and she did even order for uh, the software engineers to keep a close eye on Zilant and to always monitor its uh, operations. But she was keep making softwares in uh, several softwares all together. It should be considered the cumulatively whether she had intended to uh, uh, have uh, intention to kill or not distinguish, doesn't care distinction or. With regards to that, Your Honor, then we would refer the court to the provisions of Article 30 of the Rome Statute that intent does have to uh, require that virtual certainty in this case. Now, with regards to the development of Zilant or the development of Eagle Eye, the fact that it could malfunction or the fact that it could result on the contrary uh, consequence than what Barcino would have wished, we can see that that could potentially happen. But again, that remains only a risk at this point. Uh, in regards to the warning being uh, completely disregarded by the Bashkazan Armed Force, that remains a risk that she could not have expected. And the fact that uh, Zilant here, which had actually successfully carried out numerous attacks and that it would suddenly carry out an attack against protected objects, that also remained a risk. So while she was aware of this risk, it still does not fulfill that element of intent that has been required by the provisions of this court. Hang on, counsel. If you would concede that she, your client, has is knowledgeable about the risk, then surely that is as good as intent. She's actually got the mental element that there could be an issue here and she nonetheless goes ahead and allows her equipment, her technology to be used with knowledge that there is a risk. Your Honor, with regards to Eagle Eye, we would make the submission that she no longer has any control over Eagle Eye and that the risk here is no longer than a, a reflection on her intention at the time. Now, with regards to Zilant, uh, in regards to that, it could uh, risk that it would uh, attack a protected object or a civilian object. We make the submission that this risk is always being offset or always being remedied by the fact that she had already ordered the software engineers to continuously patch and to even monitor each and every one of Zilant's operation at this time. But she didn't ask for it to be suspended. Exactly. Now, with regards to that, uh, Your Honor, we would then uh, provide the provisions of Article 36 of Additional Protocol 1 and Article 57 to, uh, Article 57 to of also Additional Protocol 1, where the responsibility to stop this attack or to halt or suspend these kinds of attacks and the use of this weapon would not fall on Barcino as the mere developer. It would fall on the high contracting party in order to, uh, that would authorize these weapons, which could fall on the Bashkazan government or the Ministry of Defense. And in regards to precautions, or stopping the attack that only uh, regards and only can be attributed to those who are planning or deciding on the attack. 
In that case, it would be an individual or a commander within the armed force. And as counsel, such, counsel, to- counsel, but I don't recall in the facts any evidence at any time that the accused withdrew the support or that she turned and walked away. Your Honour, do you see that? Yes. Counsel, you have 30 seconds to answer that question. Your Honor, her inaction to w- walk away in this case, we submit, would still not be uh, evident of her intent. As she did make the attempts, or she did make these uh, fixes and patches in order to remedy these risks from happening. And in such, that would already disprove the fact that she had intent or she wanted for these crimes to happen or that she desired for these crimes to happen. Uh, the, uh, the the patches here would, in fact, already remedy or offset the, the risk that is happening or the risk that uh, would happen in this case. Now, I, I do see that my time is beginning to elapse for the rest of my submissions. We would rely on our written submissions. Uh, this concludes my submission before the court. Thank you and may it please the court. Thank you, counsel. Counsel, when ready, you can start your rebuttal. Your Excellencies, one point in rebuttal on occupation under count one. Now, earlier, Your Excellencies posed certain questions concerning whether or not there must be physical presence of troops in order for there to be occupation. Now, in response, the defence fervently argued that there must be presence of physical troops engaged with military operations for a territory to be occupied. Now, respectfully, this is wrong as a matter of law. Now, first, the Israel, the 2020 Israel and Palestine decision has been affirmed by multiple UN Security Council and General Assembly resolutions to amount to a state of occupation. Now, furthermore, according to the same commentary relied on by the defense, the 2016 ICRC commentary on Article 2, it states that in exceptional cases, in particular where foreign forces have redrawn but continue to retain key elements of governmental functions, the law of occupation still applies. Now, this is clearly evident on our facts, and we say so for four reasons. First, security fences were built around the region and border movements were controlled. Now, second, an administration like the PrEP was built up to govern Polotska, even though it only represented minority views. And thirdly, we see that the BAF could close off the region whenever they needed time to round up PLF members. Now, finally, and most importantly, Your Excellencies, if we look at the key facts of Count One, the fact that the, gov- the Bashkazan government could conduct massive arrests of Palut's inhabitants and subsequently confine them to their homes, this must be the case that they exercised effective control over Palutska. Given that there was occupation, we submit that the conduct took place in the context of an IAC. Now, unless I may be of any assistance to this court. No, thank you, counsel, for your this submission. This concludes the prosecution's rebuttal. May it please this court. Thank you. As counsel for the defendant, if you're ready, you may proceed with your sir rebuttal. Madam President, Your Honours, the defense makes one point in sir rebuttal in direct response to the point of rebuttal made by the prosecution. The prosecution has submitted that the UNSC has recognized that, for example, Israel's, uh, that Israel had occupied the, the, the territory of Gaza. However, that's not true. The UNSC has only mentioned that Israel should stop attacking, stop going back into Gaza to make its, uh, to make, uh, to make its authority felt. But that did not amount to, to a point of occupation. And in fact, if we look at the defense's memor- the prosecution's memorial, they've only cited two United Nations General Assembly resolutions. Now, we remind the court, pursuant to Article 10 of the Charter, of the UN Charter, UNGA resolutions are non-binding. They're only recommendations. And indeed, they only reflect the view of a political body. Now, the International Court of Justice, in paragraphs 188 to 190 of its 1986 Nicaragua decision, held that, yes, the view of the UNGA can be helpful in identifying legal rules, but not necessarily that their formulation of factual situations are binding on any legal body. 
And so we would submit that the views of the UNSC and the UNGA do not support the claims made by the prosecution. Furthermore, we remind the courts of the reason why the enemy forces have to be present in the territory. It's so that they can carry out the obligations. Now, the prosecution claims that this could have been carried out by the PRAP or the administrative body placed in there. Now, we'd refer the court to the real-life situation of the United States occupation of Iraq from 2003 to 2004. Now, in 2004, the United States and the Coalition Provisional Authority made agreement with the Iraqi Government Council. And following that agreement, in which they gave the government autonomy in that region, that was no longer considered a situation of occupation. It's true the United States was still able to go into that territory and carry out military operations, but because the authority had already been transferred to this group of people, that constituted no longer a situation of occupation. In light of this, we submit the court should take the points of the defense. Thank you and may it please the court. Thank you, counsel. For the audience at live streaming, this session is now adjourned for the time being. Please stay tuned as we shall be right back to announce the results. The prize presentation ceremony will start at around 5 p.m. The live streaming will be back again soon. Meanwhile, with the judges and the mooters, please stay and wait in the first courtroom. Thank you. volunteers of the Ukrainian Red Cross Society. We are recording this video from Ukraine that is currently affected by a large-scale armed conflict. The whole country is under fire. Close to 100 people have died. Many more injured. There are children among them. Millions of people had to leave their homes looking for safe places for their families. Everyone needs our support at the moment. In Ukrainian Red Cross, we have around 3,000 volunteers and for last two days, 1,000 new volunteers come to join us. Uh, at the moment, the situation is in Ukraine uh, only worsening. Many more people will need to help uh, uh, of Ukrainian Red Cross. We're staying here and working for these people. We will be very grateful to any support to the population of Ukraine. Pass this message to those who should see it.
香港红十字会除咗扎根香港做好本地嘅赈灾同埋备灾工作之外，亦都積極支援世界各地应对灾难嘅工作。受到新冠疫情嘅影响，我哋唔可以亲身去到外地，但係就改为遥距参与国际项目，为受到疫情、战乱、天灾等等多重危机威胁嘅地方提供支援。同時，我哋都以專業務實嘅態度服務本地社群，支援大眾嘅身心需要，共度逆境普及急救，人人救人。急救系每个人都应该具备嘅知识。喺疫情期间，本会急救课程嘅结合式教学模式发挥作用，打破限制，做到课堂无间断。另外，本会嘅社区服务亦都冇因为疫情而停顿。我哋嘅职员同埋义工继续将心比心咁去关怀弱势社群，为民远游，同埋进行健康同卫生嘅教育。同時開展咗多項長遠嘅工作，去幫助社區復原。话有危就有机，疫情之下，人道教育中心以全新面貌服务公众，例如红十字资料馆全面数码化，亚太区红十字国际人道法模拟法庭比赛，亦都系第一次以线上模拟诉讼形式举行。社会经济受疫情影响，我哋推出咗唔同计划，支援青年人身心发展，亦为佢哋投身职场做好准备。喺咁特別嘅一年，我哋繼續貫徹原則之餘，亦努力適應新常態，務求與時並進，回應社會需要。
We cannot accept a world where an algorithm can kill. Where a machine triggered by its environment determines whether you live or die. Yet governments are spending like never before to automate their weapons. Developing drones, robots, submarines and tanks that can select an attack without human intervention. So many weapons that are today controlled remotely may tomorrow be left to sensors and software. A machine gun attached to a driverless vehicle could be programmed to roll into cities and fire away. Motion heat and video sensors could be used to trigger an armed robot at a checkpoint. And large numbers of armed drones could be interconnected to attack in swarms. Today's wars are predominantly fought in cities and towns. Unlike open battlefields, these populated areas are complicated, congested places. Here, an autonomous weapon could easily hit a family car instead of a military vehicle, or a civilian instead of a soldier. Even where autonomous weapons hit the right target, the risk for civilians and essential infrastructure will be difficult to gauge and limit, as required by the laws of war. Increasing autonomy in weapons enables militaries to attack and counterattack at vast speeds. The risk of attacks and conflicts spiraling out of human control is real. And the users of an autonomous weapon cannot be sure to strike only military targets or effectively assess the risk to civilians. Yet fighters must make these legal and moral judgments whichever weapons they use. Developers of digital technologies have themselves warned Machines will never be able to bring a genuine humanity to their interactions, no matter how good they get at faking it. If we don't want our faces, our movements, our gestures, our communications, our location, the number plates on our cars to be the trigger for a bullet or a missile without human judgment, governments must act now. Just as with anti-personal landmines, blinding laser weapons and cluster bombs, we need a new legally binding treaty to protect civilians and combatants and preserve a measure of humanity in warfare. Unpredictable autonomous weapons should be prohibited. Autonomous weapons that target people should be prohibited. All other autonomous weapons should be strictly regulated to protect civilians. International humanitarian law protects people around the world by limiting suffering caused by war. The 1949 Geneva Conventions agreed to by countries worldwide draw clear distinctions between those who are fighting and those who are not, such as the wounded civilians and prisoners of war. They continue to address the challenges that people and societies face as a result of modern warfare. The first convention protects wounded and sick soldiers. It guarantees humane treatment, medical care, and protection from violence, including murder and torture. It ensures the collection of the sick, wounded, and dead while protecting medical personnel and facilities. The Convention recognizes the Red Cross and Red Crescent as visible signs of protection. The Second Convention adapts the first to armed forces at sea, the wounded, sick, and shipwrecked. The Third Convention protects prisoners of war. POWs must be treated humanely and notably never be murdered or tortured. They must not be subjected to sexual violence. Women and other POWs facing particular risks benefit from specific protections. POWs must be provided with adequate food, water, clothing, shelter, and medical attention. They must be allowed to write home to be visited by the ICRC and be released without delay after the cessation of active hostilities. The Fourth Convention protects civilians, particularly those in the hands of an adversary. Protected civilians must be treated humanely. Acts such as murder or torture are never permitted. They must not be subjected to sexual violence. Groups that face particular risks, including women and children, are specifically protected. An occupying power must, as much as possible, ensure the population's food and medical supplies. The Convention has rules on humanitarian relief and protects interned civilians, including the ICRC's right to visit. The Conventions must be applied without discrimination, whatever, for example, a person's race, sex, nationality, religion, or political opinion. While the Conventions govern international armed conflicts, those between states, Article 3 common to the Conventions provides fundamental protections in all non-international armed conflicts. 
those involving non-state parties. This is essential as such conflicts today represent the majority. Three additional protocols widen the Convention's safeguards. Protocol 1 on international armed conflicts articulates key principles for the conduct of hostilities, among other important protections. Protocol 2 contains vital rules for certain non-international armed conflicts, and Protocol 3 recognizes the red crystal as an additional emblem. Customary international law complements the treaties in all types of armed conflicts. International humanitarian law upholds humanity in conflict. It seeks to prevent the worst at the worst of times. When respected, it can avoid the creation of unsurmountable grievances, making it easier to return to peace. We're in a climate emergency. For many people in Mali, it's a race against time. Ici, c'était une grande forêt. D'abord, c'était notre lac où nous cultivons. Avec le, la sécheresse aujourd'hui, c'était devenu une forêt. Après la forêt, c'est le gaz. Ce gaz-là est venu ronger tout ce qu'on a comme arbre ici. Le gaz a brûlé toute la terre. Ça, c'est quelque chose que les arbres, la terre a changé de couleur. Roughly two-thirds of Mali is desert or semi-desert, exposed to climate-related hazards such as drought, floods, locust invasions. Since 1980, 28 major droughts have affected over 7 million people. Temperatures have increased by 0.7 degrees across most of the country. And little climate finance reaches those communities that need it most. Mali has also been wracked by conflict since 2012. In the north, violence has resulted in death, displacement and economic instability. Up to 2021, more than 300,000 people have been uprooted from their homes. Cattle herders fear attacks from armed groups and tensions rise over scarce resources. Meanwhile, desertification advances. There is a force plus forte than us who has come to destroy us. Why is it that the sable is not here? 400 élèves, cela veut dire toute une génération, une génération perdue.
Hello world! We are volunteers of the Ukrainian Red Cross Society. We are recording this video from Ukraine that is currently affected by a large-scale armed conflict. The whole country is under fire. Close to 100 people have died. Many more injured. There are children among them. Millions of people had to leave their homes looking for safe places for their families. Everyone needs our support at the moment. In Ukrainian Red Cross we have around 3,000 volunteers and for last two days 1,000 new volunteers come to join us. Uh, at the moment the situation is in Ukraine uh, only worsening. Many more people will need to help uh, uh, of Ukrainian Red Cross. We're staying here and working for these people. We will be very grateful to any support to the population of Ukraine. Pass this message to those who should see it.香港紅十字會除了扎根香港做好本地的鎮災和被災區工作之外急救是每個人都應該具備的知識在疫情期間同時開展了多項長遠的工作去幫助社區復原有危就有機
喺咁特别嘅一年，我哋继续贯彻原则之余，亦努力适应新常态，务求与时并进，回应社会需要。Not accept a world where an algorithm can kill, where a machine triggered by its environment determines whether you live or die. Yet governments are spending like never before to automate their weapons, developing drones, robots, submarines, and tanks that can select an attack without human intervention. So many weapons that are today controlled remotely may tomorrow be left to sensors and software. A machine gun attached to a driverless vehicle could be programmed to roll into cities and fly away. Motion, heat, and video sensors could be used to trigger an armed robot at a checkpoint, and large numbers of armed drones could be interconnected to attack in swarms. Today's wars are predominantly fought in cities and towns. Unlike open battlefields, these populated areas are complicated, congested places. Here, an autonomous weapon could easily hit a family car. Instead of a military vehicle, or a civilian instead of a soldier, even where autonomous weapons hit the right target, the risk for civilians and essential infrastructure will be difficult to gauge and limit, as required by the laws of war. Increasing autonomy in weapons enables militaries to attack and counterattack at vast speeds. The risk of attacks and conflicts spiraling out of human control is real. And the users of an autonomous weapon cannot be sure to strike only military targets, or effectively assess the risk to civilians. Yet fighters must make these legal and moral judgments, whichever weapons they use. Developers of digital technologies have themselves warned: machines will never be able to bring a genuine humanity to their interactions, no matter how good they get at faking it. If we don't want our faces, our movements, our gestures, our communications, our location, the number plates on our cars to be the trigger for a bullet or a missile, without human judgment, governments must act now. Just as with anti-personal landmines, blinding laser weapons, and cluster bombs, we need a new legally binding treaty to protect civilians and combatants and preserve a measure of humanity in warfare. Unpredictable autonomous weapons. Should be prohibited. Autonomous weapons that target people should be prohibited. All other autonomous weapons should be strictly regulated to protect civilians. International humanitarian law protects people around the world by limiting suffering caused by war. The 1949 Geneva Conventions, agreed to by countries worldwide, draw clear distinctions between those who are fighting and those who are not. Such as the wounded civilians and prisoners of war.
They continue to address the challenges that people and societies face as a result of modern warfare. The first convention protects wounded and sick soldiers. It guarantees humane treatment, medical care, and protection from violence, including murder and torture. It ensures the collection of the sick, wounded, and dead while protecting medical personnel and facilities. The convention recognizes the Red Cross and Red Crescent as visible signs of protection. The second convention adapts the first to armed forces at sea, the wounded, sick, and shipwrecked. The third convention protects prisoners of war. POWs must be treated humanely and notably never be murdered or tortured. They must not be subjected to sexual violence. Women and other POWs facing particular risks benefit from specific protections. POWs must be provided with adequate food, water, clothing, shelter, and medical attention. They must be allowed to write home to be visited by the ICRC and be released without delay after the cessation of active hostilities. The Fourth Convention protects civilians, particularly those in the hands of an adversary. Protected civilians must be treated humanely. Acts such as murder or torture are never permitted. They must not be subjected to sexual violence. Groups that face particular risks, including women and children, are specifically protected. An occupying power must, as much as possible, ensure the population's food and medical supplies. The Convention has rules on humanitarian relief and protects interned civilians, including the ICRC's right to visit. The conventions must be applied without discrimination, whatever, for example, a person's race, sex, nationality, religion, or political opinion. While the conventions govern international armed conflicts, those between states, Article 3 common to the conventions provides fundamental protections in all non-international armed conflicts, those involving non-state parties. This is essential as such conflicts today represent the majority. Three additional protocols widen the Convention's safeguards. Protocol 1 on international armed conflicts articulates key principles for the conduct of hostilities, among other important protections. Protocol 2 contains vital rules for certain non-international armed conflicts, and Protocol 3 recognizes the red crystal as an additional emblem. Customary international law complements the treaties in all types of armed conflicts. International humanitarian law upholds humanity in conflict. It seeks to prevent the worst at the worst of times. When respected, it can avoid the creation of unsurmountable grievances, making it easier to return to peace. We're in a climate emergency. For many people in Mali, it's a race against time. Ici, c'était une grande forêt. D'abord, c'était notre lac où nous cultivons. Avec le, la sécheresse aujourd'hui, c'était devenu une forêt. Après la forêt, c'est le gaz. Ce gaz-là est venu ronger tout ce qu'on a comme arbre ici. Le gaz a brûlé toute la terre. Ça, c'est quelque chose que les arbres, la terre a changé de couleur. Roughly two-thirds of Mali is desert or semi-desert, exposed to climate-related hazards such as drought, floods, locust invasions. Since 1980, 28 major droughts have affected over 7 million people. Temperatures have increased by 0.7 degrees across most of the country. And little climate finance reaches those communities that need it most. Mali has also been racked by conflict since 2012. In the north, violence has resulted in death, displacement and economic instability. Up to 2021, more than 300,000 people have been uprooted from their homes. Cattle herders fear attacks from armed groups and tensions rise over scarce resources. Meanwhile, desertification advances. There is a force more forte than us who is coming to destroy us. You see, this dune of sable was not there. 400 élèves, cela veut dire toute une génération, une génération perdue.
Hello world. We are volunteers of the Ukrainian Red Cross Society. We are recording this video from Ukraine that is currently affected by a large-scale armed conflict. The whole country is under fire. Close to 100 people have died. Many more injured. There are children among them. Millions of people had to leave their homes looking for safe places for their families. Everyone needs our support at the moment. In Ukrainian Red Cross, we have around 3,000 volunteers and for last two days, 1,000 new volunteers come to join us. Uh, at the moment, the situation is in Ukraine uh, only worsening. Many more people will need to help uh, uh, of Ukrainian Red Cross. We're staying here and working for these people. We will be very grateful to any support to the population of Ukraine. Pass this message to those who should see it.香港紅十字會除了扎根香港做好本地的震災和被災難的工作受到新冠疫情的影響我們不可以親身去到外地但是就改為要他參與國際項目為受到疫情、戰亂、天災等多重危機威脅的地方提供支援同時我們也以專業
。喺咁特別嘅一年，我哋繼續貫徹原則之餘，亦努力適應新常態，務求與時並進，回應社會需要。Accept a world where an algorithm can kill, where a machine triggered by its environment determines whether you live or die. Yet governments are spending like never before to automate their weapons, developing drones, robots, submarines, and tanks that can select an attack without human intervention. So many weapons that are today controlled remotely may tomorrow be left to sensors and software. A machine gun attached to a driverless vehicle could be programmed to roll into cities and fire away. Motion, heat, and video sensors could be used to trigger an armed robot at a checkpoint, and large numbers of armed drones could be interconnected to attack in swarms. Today's wars are predominantly fought in cities and towns. Unlike open battlefields, these populated areas are complicated, congested places. Here, an autonomous weapon could easily hit a family car. Instead of a military vehicle, or a civilian instead of a soldier, even where autonomous weapons hit the right target, the risk for civilians and essential infrastructure will be difficult to gauge and limit, as required by the laws of war. Increasing autonomy in weapons enables militaries to attack and counterattack at vast speeds. The risk of attacks and conflicts spiraling out of human control is real. And the users of an autonomous weapon cannot be sure to strike only military targets, or effectively assess the risk to civilians. Yet fighters must make these legal and moral judgments, whichever weapons they use. Developers of digital technologies have themselves warned: machines will never be able to bring a genuine humanity to their interactions, no matter how good they get at faking it. If we don't want our faces, our movements, our gestures, our communications, our location, the number plates on our cars to be the trigger for a bullet or a missile, without human judgment, governments must act now. Just as with anti-personal landmines, blinding laser weapons, and cluster bombs, we need a new legally binding treaty to protect civilians and combatants and preserve a measure of humanity in warfare. Unpredictable autonomous weapons. Should be prohibited. Autonomous weapons that target people should be prohibited. All other autonomous weapons should be strictly regulated to protect civilians. International humanitarian law protects people around the world by limiting suffering caused by war. The 1949 Geneva Conventions, agreed to by countries worldwide, draw clear distinctions between those who are fighting and those who are not. Such as the wounded civilians and prisoners of war, they continue to address the challenges that people and societies face as a result of modern warfare.
The first convention protects wounded and sick soldiers. It guarantees humane treatment, medical care, and protection from violence, including murder and torture. It ensures the collection of the sick, wounded, and dead while protecting medical personnel and facilities. The Convention recognizes the Red Cross and Red Crescent as visible signs of protection. The Second Convention adapts the first to armed forces at sea, the wounded, sick, and shipwrecked. The Third Convention protects prisoners of war. POWs must be treated humanely and notably never be murdered or tortured. They must not be subjected to sexual violence. Women and other POWs facing particular risks benefit from specific protections. POWs must be provided with adequate food, water, clothing, shelter, and medical attention. They must be allowed to write home, to be visited by the ICRC, and be released without delay after the cessation of active hostilities. The Fourth Convention protects civilians, particularly those in the hands of an adversary. Protected civilians must be treated humanely. Acts such as murder or torture are never permitted. They must not be subjected to sexual violence. Groups that face particular risks, including women and children, are specifically protected. An occupying power must, as much as possible, ensure the population's food and medical supplies. The Convention has rules on humanitarian relief and protects interned civilians, including the ICRC's right to visit. The conventions must be applied without discrimination, whatever, for example, a person's race, sex, nationality, religion, or political opinion. While the conventions govern international armed conflicts, those between states, Article 3 common to the conventions provides fundamental protections in all non-international armed conflicts, those involving non-state parties. This is essential as such conflicts today represent the majority. Three additional protocols widen the Convention's safeguards. Protocol 1 on international armed conflicts articulates key principles for the conduct of hostilities, among other important protections. Protocol 2 contains vital rules for certain non-international armed conflicts, and Protocol 3 recognizes the red crystal as an additional emblem. Customary international law complements the treaties in all types of armed conflicts. International humanitarian law upholds humanity in conflict. It seeks to prevent the worst at the worst of times. When respected, it can avoid the creation of unsurmountable grievances, making it easier to return to peace. We're in a climate emergency. For many people in Mali, it's a race against time. Ici, c'était une grande forêt. D'abord, c'était notre lac où nous cultivons. Avec le, la sécheresse aujourd'hui, c'était devenu une forêt. Après la forêt, c'est le gaz. Ce gaz-là est venu rejeter tout ce qu'on a comme arbre ici. Le gaz a brûlé toute la terre. Ça, c'est quelque chose que les arbres, la terre a changé de couleur. Roughly two-thirds of Mali is desert or semi-desert, exposed to climate-related hazards such as drought, floods, locust invasions. Since 1980, 28 major droughts have affected over 7 million people. Temperatures have increased by 0.7 degrees across most of the country. And little climate finance reaches those communities that need it most. Mali has also been wracked by conflict since 2012. In the north, violence has resulted in death, displacement and economic instability. Up to 2021, more than 300,000 people have been uprooted from their homes. Cattle herders fear attacks from armed groups and tensions rise over scarce resources. Meanwhile, desertification advances. Il y a une force plus forte que nous qui est venue détruire. Vous voyez, cette dune de sable n'était pas là. 400 élèves, cela veut dire toute une génération, une génération perdue.
Distinguished guests, judges, participants, ladies and gentlemen, I am Barbara, the MC of today's prize presentation ceremony. Good afternoon. May I invite all of you to turn on your camera so that we can say hello to all of you. Welcome to the prize presentation ceremony of the 20th Red Cross International Humanitarian Law Mood, which is co-organized by the Red Cross um, the Hong Kong Red Cross and the International Committee of the Red Cross Regional Delegation of East Asia. The 20th International Red Cross Mood Competition has come to its conclusion. In view of the COVID-19 pandemic this year, the Mood has gone virtual and we had the audience from Asia Pacific region watching the IHL Mood and prize presentation ceremony live at YouTube. You are deeply grateful for the enthusiastic participation by law students from 24 universities from the Asia Pacific region. This year, two general rounds, one quarter final round, one semi final round, and one final round have been held. Over 70 judges were involved. To start our ceremony, May I now invite Ms. Graciela Lete Pickley, Deputy Head of the ICRC Regional Delegation for East Asia, to give an opening remarks. Thank you. Honorable Madam Justice Carly Shu, Judge at the Court of Appeal of the Hong Kong High Court, Dear Ambrose Ho, President of the Organizing Committee of the Moot. Dear Ms. Eleanor Lam, Deputy Chief Executive Officer, Deputy Secretary General of the Hong Kong Red Cross. Dear Professor Stan Verhoeven, Zhejiang University City College. Distinguished judges and guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor to be with you at the occasion of the 20th edition of the International Humanitarian Law Moot Court for the Asia Pacific region. I, I would like to sincerely thank the Hong Kong Red Cross Society for their commitment and professionalism in organizing this successful Moot Court and for ensuring, once again, the smooth running of the competition. For the third time in a row, and hopefully the last, the COVID pandemic has forced us to accommodate and find solutions to run this moot court. For the last three editions, we managed to maintain a competition. And uh, we found together the capacity to adapt in digitalizing the auto round, making it as lively and uh, exciting as possible for the students and keeping the core aspect of the mood, which is it is oral nature. I would thus like to express my gratitude for the organizing team, once again, for your commitment, dedication, and hard work during these five days. As, as always, and um, with a sweet flavor this year, I can say on behalf of the International Committee of the Red Cross, that it has been, again, a great pleasure working with the Hong Kong Red Cross Society. As for all the judges that I see here present, please accept my sincere gratitude for the time and energy you have dedicated to this competition. It also shows how much you believe in the work of the students that are gathered here and how important it is to support them in their academic development. 
20 years since the first edition of the IHL Moot Court. And uh, this competition has become a flagship event for the dissemination and promotion of international humanitarian law. It has been recognized internationally and it's a source of inspiration, not only for students, but also for all those involved in this competition. It is as well a formidable example of a long-standing cooperation between the Hong Kong Red Cross and the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC. And uh, this shows how different components of the Red Cross Red Crescent movement can join hands and come together in preparing and delivering their common mandate in promoting the teaching and understanding of international humanitarian law. This year, I learned that 24 universities from across the Asia Pacific region have gathered these five days of competition, and that is remarkable. On this occasion, I would like to thank all the teams for their hard work and dedication. My colleagues have informed me that the quality of your memorials and presentations and your impressive hard work and advocacy skills have maintained the high standards of the competition and the reputation that this competition enjoys. So your commitment to the study of international humanitarian law is an embodiment of the spirit of humanity and a great encouragement for our work as well. And uh, I wanted to conclude my opening remarks saying that while it remains a moot court and a purely fictive case study, the notions that you have studied these past months, in particular, those concerning the protection of civilians during armed conflicts and the application of international humanitarian law are everything but fictitious. In the world we see out there, these notions are certainly not abstract nor part of a, a mere textbook case. They are words that protect effectively. They are words that take their concrete protective nature because they are applied and defended by many in the field, but also in offices amongst the military, the diplomats, and international organizations, as well as other academic organizations. Whether you become a judge or a military lawyer or a counsel before the International Court, Criminal Court, or any related institution, or a delegate of the International Committee of the Red Cross, or a diplomat serving your country, you will encounter these critical notions and you will be part of those who make them meaningful. International humanitarian law today, as we see, is as relevant as ever. We are together witnessing that nowadays. As we are waiting for the final announcements, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate in advance the winning teams and individuals. I have absolutely no doubt that today is not just the end of the competition. It is also a fresh beginning of our awareness and our commitment towards humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Graciela. Now I would like to invite Mr. Ambrose Ho, 
the chairman of the organizing committee of Red Cross International Humanitarian Law Board 2022 to deliver a vote of thanks. Mr. Ho, please. Thank you. Um, Madam Justice Chu, Ms. Pickley, Dr. Crawley, Professor Verhoeven, Ms. Welch, Professor Park, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, thank you all for your presence at the 20th Red Cross International Humanitarian Law Boot. This is truly a very happy occasion that we are here celebrating the 20th anniversary of this very meaningful event. This event has a particularly special meaning this year. And we see all of a sudden the disheartening situation in Ukraine has been catapulted to center stage in international affairs. The whole world is anxiously watching the development of the conflict and cannot but be worried about the plight of those helpless victims of the war. All of a sudden, humanitarian values and the importance of preventing violation of principles of humanitarian law have assumed very real significance in what is happening in Ukraine. And let us hope that rationality will prevail and that people will no longer have to endure living in fear to have to leave their homeland or be separated from their families or even witness their loved ones perish. Not only has the war brought about much suffering, this year most parts of the world are still plagued by the COVID pandemic. In fact, this is already the second year that this moot competition for the Asia Pacific region has to be conducted online. And now taking full advantage of technology, this competition can be smoothly conducted and we are still keeping our fingers crossed with online submissions of memorials together with virtual oral hearings. And this year, we are very glad to have 24 teams from this region joining us in the competition. For 159 years, the Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement has overcome difficulties around the globe to prevent and alleviate human sufferings wherever they may be. This 20th Red Cross IHL moot is a polemicist in which we hope participants in this event will all take home with raised awareness on issues relating to IHL. We hope participants will be empowered, equipped, and encouraged to keep a close eye on pressing humanitarian issues around the world. We hope one day these efforts will bear fruits. Humanitarian values will prevail to protect the vulnerable, the underserved communities like those in war. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank our guests from ICRC, Ms. Grazelia Piccoli, also the co-organizer of this event, the ICRC Beijing delegation for their professional and indispensable support for this competition. This year, we are very privileged to have five distinguished judges in the final round. Madam Justice Chu, the Justice of Peel and the Court of Appeal in Hong Kong, who has very kindly agreed to be the chief judge of this final round of moot. Dr. Michael Crawley, and of course, who needs no introduction to this event, who is a very long-term supporter of this moot uh, from the very beginning. Professor Stan Van Heusen, G. 
Zhejiang University City College, who's been supporting us these years for drafting the moot problem. Ms. Kirsty Welsh, legal advisor of RCRC headquarters and advisory services on IHL. Professor Ji Hoon Park, Professor of Law, Yongsan University. To all the judges, we're greatly indebted for your support. The Hong Kong Red Cross would also like to express our gratitude to the Hong Kong judiciary and also the local professionals who have shown very generous support by joining us as judges in the oral hearings. Our gratitude also goes to King Wood Medicines for their professional, as well as importantly, for financial support. We're thankful to the support from the two collaborating universities, the University of Hong Kong and Chinese University of Hong Kong. Their unfailing support is important to smooth running of the moot. And last but not least, I must thank the many volunteers, members of the organizing committee, staff members of Hong Kong Red Cross, who have been working very hard to ensure that the event runs smoothly. And I hope that all of you find this mooting competition an enriching and memorable experience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambrose. Just now, we can watch the moot through YouTube live streaming. Both teams are debating vigorously. And now I would like to invite the respective judges of final round to give some comments on the moot competition and to the teams. First, may I invite Madam Justice Corley Chu, the Chief Judge of the 20th Red Cross International Humanitarian Law Moot Panel. Madam Justice Corley Chu has served as Justice of Appeal of the Court of Appeal of the High Court since June 2011. Madam Chief, please. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the finalists uh, for a very, um, I would say, professional um, performance as advocates and also uh, in terms of um, the presentations of the arguments. Uh, no doubt both sides are very well prepared and, and have a great familiarity with the applicable laws. Um, we've, we've seen a very high standard of advocacy, uh, both in terms of being able to engage with the arguments of the other side right at the beginning of the presentations, as well as being able to respond to questions from the bench, sometimes slightly aggressive, but um, your responses have been measured, uh, calm, and uh, mostly to the point. Um, and, and to me, um, who is not really well um, conversed with the relevant laws, um, I, I would uh, place a great emphasis on, on your advocacy and your presentations. And I'm very happy also to see that you're able to address sometimes the policy uh, considerations, um, which is particularly important um, because the issues in this wood problem uh, rest upon um, areas that had not been subject to previous decisions. Namely, what do you do with someone who manufacture or provides um, uh, um, high-tech um, technology to, to um, the authorities involved in the conflicts? And so for, for these novel areas of law, uh, the ability to address the uh, policy considerations and a wider implications uh, seems to me to be critical. And, and as I've said, I'm happy to see that um, you've, you've tried to engage in that. Um, if there is anything that I can uh, contribute um, for your further development, whether as advocates or, or as mutas, would be this. Um, as in a lot of the problems, you have uh, great areas 
uh, of things that you can argue about, um, but you have very little time. Um, therefore, um, the ability to um, identify what are the most critical matters to address and to prioritize the arguments seems to me um, is quite important um, because this would uh, enable you to have a good shape to your um, presentations and also enables, um, for, for instance, the judges and others to follow um, the flow of your arguments and also uh, what, in fact, are you driving at at the end of the day? So um, really, uh, that that is the only bit that I think you, you might want to um, further develop uh, in, in your future career. So uh, lastly, as I've said, I, I very much enjoyed um, this afternoon's arguments from both sides. Um, they have um, opened my eyes to a lot of uh, matters uh, that I have not hitherto um, uh, know. So thank you once again for all the finalists uh, for your very hard work. And I wish you um, every um, best of luck uh, in your future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Ji. Now may I invite Dr. Michael Crowley, experienced legal practitioner and long-term supporter of the IHL Norwood. Thank you. Look, I concur with everything Justice Chu has said. I think the performance of all four of the finalists was very professional. I think the way you approached the exercise was excellent. But I also agree with Justice Chu that you need to think carefully about time management. Um, we had some preliminary issues and three counts. And I would like to spend a bit more time on counts one and three. But leaving that aside, I think all your performances were very professional. There was good law. There was some good policy. I agree with all of that. And I think in the count where there wasn't any law, that would have been fascinating to have spent some more time on that. But this is one of the risks of doing a moot. Uh, unlike in a real courtroom, the judge can sit back and say, well, we'll come back tomorrow or whatever, or we'll sit over time. In a moot, we can't do that. But I was very heartened by your performances. I think you all have bright futures ahead of you as advocates or as lawyers, and I wish you all the best on your future careers. I think what we saw tonight, this evening, were four young advocates all demonstrating great skills which they can build upon for the future. Look, congratulations and best wishes for your future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Crowley. Now may I invite Professor Stan Iris Verhoeven from Zhejiang University City College, our moot problem director. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it was a pleasure that this year I could work on this case, which again, I have to congratulate both teams to an excellent job in tackling the issues where there are not yet any clear answers available. Again, this case was a bit more futuristic than other years, but this could well be the future of warfare and those issues could be raised in the near future. And the question is, how can the rules, who, which did not envisage this situation, how can they be used to hold people accountable? And I have to say, both the teams I saw today, and I'm for sure the other teams as well, did an amazing job in tackling this complicated issue. However, I have to concur with my colleagues that we wish that some of you had spent some time on one of the key issues of the other charges. So um, my advice would be in the near future, if you are doing moods again, think about what are the arguments you definitely want to make. And if you have 20 minutes, try to make a pleading that only lasts 10 minutes 
and deals with the core issues of the case. You, both sides have amazing law. You know IHL and international criminal law extremely well. But sometimes that means that you're going to put too many arguments in those 20 minutes. And as a result, your time management will suffer. So for the future, try to limit your pleading to the issues that are the weakest maybe for your side. Work on that. What are the core problems you are facing? So that will help your time management tremendously. And it will also help you to um, deal with most of the core issues in the case. But I have to congratulate both teams for their excellent performance and how they handled the questions. We got immediate responses to the point and accurate, which is really fantastic to witness that. Another minor suggestion, what I would want you to think about, it's not because you legally can make an argument that you should make that argument. Sometimes an argument brings you more problems than benefits, even if theoretically and legally you can make it. So think about the implications of the arguments you advance. Is it really the best strategy to make this argument, even if you are maybe right? So work on the time management, think about the strategy, but these are minor notes on the performance of both teams which was extraordinary. So again, I congratulate both teams for their outstanding performance today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Verhoeven. Now may I invite Ms. Christy Welch, Legal Advisor of ICRC Headquarters, Advisory Services on IHL to give us some comments. Thank you very much. And it's really been an honor and a privilege to be part of the final round today. Um, clearly working for the ICRC, we're already um, completely convinced and some may say even geeky around understanding IHL. So reading the MOOC problem, I already knew that today would be an enjoyable experience, but it was watching the professionalism, the nuanced arguments, the innovative arguments of both of the teams that really meant that today was really quite a remarkable day. So I thank you for giving me that experience. And I hope that all of you, all of the mooters, not just the mooters in this final round, also experience the same, that this experience in the competition, of course it was challenging, of course you worked hard, of course it was tiring, but I hope it was enriching. I hope that you were able to make connections with others, you were able to see the arguments others developed, which would help your future understanding of your, your career development and how you frame your arguments in the future. I would concur completely with the comments made by my fellow judges, so I won't spend too long on that, but just to say of particular note for me, I was very impressed with how all of the mooters today handled the questions. It's not easy when you're grilled by a judge, but you all maintained absolute decorum, complete respect, and we were all very impressed by that. Um, from the ICRC's point of view, we can completely sympathise with you around how challenging this problem was. On a daily basis, I'm asked, can the law that was created in some cases a generation or multiple generations ago continue to be relevant in a time where technologies are developing so fast and in a direction that could not possibly have been predicted at the time of the codification of the laws. What I think we saw today was that you demonstrated that the law can be adapted, that with the right attitude, approach and response strategies, the law is very much fit for purpose and it's a question of implementation and understanding of that law. So I thank you for that contribution that you've made to this debate. I hope that, as has been said, you continue in your career as advocates, but not just legal advocates. I hope for the sake of humanity, you continue as an IHL advocate, an advocate for the benefits of this particular field of law, because I feel by doing that, this field of law is very safe in your hands, as you've demonstrated today. So really, you should be proud of all that you have achieved in this final round today. All four mooters were outstanding 
I hear that the other rounds, there was also excellent levels of discussion. So really everyone who has participated in this competition, I hope that you are proud of your achievements. You take a moment to reflect on those, whatever the results of today's competition may be. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Welch. Last but not the least, may I invite Professor Jin Hong Park, Professor, Faculty of Law, Yongsan University. Okay, thank you for um, uh, inviting me, and it's a really uh, big honor for me to uh, join after I became a review. Uh, the editorial member of the um, International Review. It has been a long journey of attending a book court of whole day in Korea, book competition, and half day here in Hong Kong. And it's a great, a great pleasure for me to participate and see the growing interest of IATL. You know, IATL at first, um, I have to congratulate great that you have now have big interest in IHL. That itself is uh, uh, giving you the great opportunity to have love in your mind. And secondly, I'm, I'm really uh, um, impressed that you have extensive knowledge of IHL. Before, at the beginning of a MOOC course, a long time before, uh, they only said about the IHL principles. And then slowly, slowly, they change it to uh, ICC and ICJ uh, cases. So now I see so many students now, mutters are uh, all covering the ICC cases, ICJ cases, including the IHL mentioned there. So uh, it's a, pleasure, a great pleasure and a really uh, good uh, opportunity for me to see the development of uh, 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 le young leaders interest in IHL. You know, law is actually very sharp, but uh, IHL has a deeper love. So you can feel the love inside once you know the IHL. So it seems like uh, reading an ethical novel rather than reading a law if you are into <laughs> knowing the IHL. So um, thank you. and. Uh, Really uh, um, appreciate that you are uh, participating in the MOOC court competition. And I see the great future of yours. Uh, the one thing that you have to think about it is um, the one that the respect of the emblem could have covered at the end of the, the point three, you know, count three. So uh, I'm sorry that I have I missed the opportunity to talk about the emblem at this important rule competition. But at the same time, Ang Dinang will be very happy to see the 20th anniversary here at Mood Court competition. And uh, thank you and good luck to all. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Park. Now here comes the climax of the 20 Records International Humanitarian Law Wood, the announcement of the Wood Team competition results and the prize presentations. This year, the prize of the best memorial, first honorable submission and second honorable submission are awarded to written memorials from each of the prosecutor and the defendant that obtained the top three highest average score among the 24 memorials from each side, submitted by the participating teams. Now, I would like to invite Ms. Graziella Lecky Piccoli, Deputy Head of the ICRC Regional Delegation for East Asia to present the awards for us. We will announce the prosecutor first, Ms. Piccoli, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me this, the floor to, to share these this, this initial results here on the best memorial regarding the prosecutor. So the second honorable submission, we have three teams here. I will announce them. It's a three team number three, Jilin University of China. 
Hi, can you wave your hand? Yeah, to receive our congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, there is also team number four. It's University of San Agustin, Philippines. So team number four, can you wave your hands so that we can see you? Thank you. There is also team number 12, Tongji University, China. Team number 12, congratulations. Okay. Congratulations. Yeah, with three now, teams, oh, sorry, sorry. With, <laughs> with three teams, please um, look at the camera and we will have a group picture with Ms. Pickley right now. Thank you very much. So, Ms. Pickley, please carry on. I have the pleasure now to announce the first honorable submission for the best memorial prosecutor and it's team number 20, Eastern University, Bangladesh. Congratulations, Congratulations. team number 20. Yep. Okay, so Ms. Now the, is carry on. Yeah. The best memorial, the best memorial for prosecutor goes to team number one, the University of Hong Kong. Congratulations to the University of Hong Kong. Can you please wave your hands? Okay, where is the University of Hong Kong? Okay, so thank you, thank you, Graziella. Thank you very much. Now I would like to invite Mr. Ambrose Ho the chairman of the uh, organizing committee for the 20th Red Cross IHL Mood 2022 to present the awards for the defendant side for us. Mr. Ho, please. Thank you. Um, for the best memorial, sorry, the second honorable submission, um, team number 24, the University of New South Wales. Congratulations to team number 24. Can you wave your hands so that we know where you are? Okay, thank you very much. The first honorable submission, team number 15, National Taiwan University. Congratulations to team number 15. And um, for the best memorial for the defendant side, um, there is actually a tie. We have two teams. Uh, first is team number two, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And also team number eight, Chulalong Kong, University of Thailand. Congratulations to team number two and team number eight. So please stay for the group picture with Mr. Ho. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Ambrose. Now I would like to invite Professor Stan Verhoeven. Jiajiang University City College to present the top three voters. The prizes of best voter as well as first honorable mention and second honorable mention are awarded to the top three list who obtained the highest average individual score for their oral presentation in the second general rounds. Professor Stan, please. Thank you very much. So without further ado, the second honorable mutter goes to Mr. Jeff Earl Nunez, University of San Agustin. Congratulations. Okay, please wave your hand so that we know where you are. Okay, we can see you now. Thank you, congratulations. The award for the first honorable mutter goes to 
Miss Blessy Marie Kavaling, University of San Augustin. Congratulations. Congratulations. Can you wave your hand so that we know where you are? Okay, thank you very much. Congrat congratulations. And finally, the best mutter goes to Mr. Dylan Jesse Andrian, Universitas Gajamada. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Okay, please stay for a good picture. Okay. Thank you very much. Congratulations again, and thank you, Professor Stan. Now, Welcome. we will proceed to announce the runner-up team and the winning team. We would like to express our deepest gratitude to the judges for taking time out of their respective schedules to preside um, over this competition. Our gratitude also extends to the respect, uh, respected participants, voters who accept our invitation and kept us um, enthralled over the last three days with their hotly contested debates. We shall now proceed to announce the runners-up team and the winning team. I would like to invite Dr. Michael Crawley, the judge of the 20th Records IHL Mood Final, to present the prizes. Dr. Crawley, please. Thank you. I'd like to congratulate both teams again on a very close competition, but the runner-up team is University Gadjamata for the defence. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Can could you wave your hand so that we can see where the winning team is? Yeah, thank you very much. Congratulations. As I said, it was a very close result, and the winning team was the prosecutor at Singapore Management University. Congratulations. Congratulations. Okay, we would like to take a group picture with all the winners and all the respected guests and judges. Please switch on your camera and then we will take a group photo for everyone. Okay, please switch on your camera. Okay, here we go. Say cheese. Okay, thank you very much and congratulations to all the winning teams. So we have now come to the end of the 20th Records International Humanitarian Law Mood. Despite the, uh, despite the ongoing COVID-19 situations, uh, kudos to all the 24 teams for breaking through the barriers and performing exceptionally at this year's Mood competition. We would also like to say our gratitude to the audience who live streaming over the YouTube. Hope you were all um, captivated by the uh, arguments of each team. Had it not been for the continuous and unending support from each and everyone involved, whether directly or indirectly, the 20th International Humanitarian Law Mood Competition would not have been a, a resounding success. Once again, thanks to all the participants and respective judges to make this mood uh, competition a valuable experience. We look forward to um, being the beneficiary of your patronage towards the records movement and the subsequent IHL mood competitions. And hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you very much. Stay healthy and all the best.